as was typical of China. We, but we may also find the various social strata following different forms of soteriology. As an example of the class struggle waged under a religious flag, we may take the so-called Protestant Reformation, the first onslaught of certain classes on feudal rule and its expression in Western Europe, the Roman Catholic Church. The ruling princes all sided with the Pope, the petty provincial nobility and the bourgeoisie with the moderates, headed by Luther. The artisans, semi-proletarians, and a portion of the peasants join the extreme sects, Anabaptists, etc., sometimes not without an element of communism. The religious struggles, slogans, groups of adherents of the various tendencies were a precise reflection of the struggle, the aspirations, and the alignments in the social political field. The religious superstructure is thus determined by the material conditions of human existence. Its nucleus is the reflection of the social political order of society. Other ideas group themselves about this nucleus, but their simple axis remains the social structure as transferred to the invisible world, and furthermore, as viewed from a specific class standpoint. Soul is here also a function of social matter. The following objection might be raised in the case of capitalist society. While religion continues to exist in that society throughout Europe in the form of monotheism, the capitalist social order has different forms of bourgeois domination in politics, monarchy, republic, and while production relations are based on domination and submission, they are not monarchic in character. The capitalist is a monarch in his own factory, but in society the class of capitalists usually does not operate through a single person. The Marxian theory affords, however, the only possible explanation of the religious forms of our day. The apparent contradiction above mentioned is easily disposed of. In feudal society, the monarchs and princes and officials under them had control of the semi-natural economy, economy in kind. But under capitalism, we have a powerful, new, and impersonal regulator of elemental nature, the market, with its incalculable caprices, exalting some and destroying the lives of others, playing with men as a blind, irrational, inscrutable force. What is our life? A trifle. Let the luckless dog bemoan his lot, says the poet. Divinity now distributes the lots. The Greeks and Romans already had their parse, their moira, their enanc, necessity. A compulsory force superior even to the gods. This conception was associated with the growth of exchange relations and the consequent commercial wars which endangered the very existence of Greece. The gods, the individual god also, have not always been disembodied spirits. They were fond of eating and drinking. They cohabit cohab cohabited with women, assuming the form of a dove for the purpose, in the case of the Holy Ghost. In Greece, where homosexual practices were frequent, Zeus adopted the shape of an eagle in his intercourse with the boy Ganymede. But the economic evolution which brought about an economy based on exchange and undermined the feudal political system not only plucked from the god his eagles and dove's feathers, but deprived him of his beard, his moustaches, and the other attributes of his previous incarnations. The pious bourgeois now believes in God as an unknown, unknowable, divine power on which all things depend, but with no external relation with man. The divinity is a spirit, not a crude aboriginal form. The condition may be stated as follows. Economy is characterized on the one hand by a relation of domination and submission, and on the other hand by unorganized exchange relations. The preservation of religion at all is due to the former circumstance, while the latter explains the meager and fleshless character of God today. Well, but we must not forget that we are here considering only the fundamental ideas of religion. The subsidiary notions must always be explained from the peculiar conditions of development. In concluding our consideration of religion, we must not fail to point out that the proletariat holding our views of religion is faced with the necessity of actively combating it. Hermann Gorder, in his book Der Historische <laughs> Materialismus, 
not only departs from philosophical materialism, but takes a purely petty bourgeois and opportunistic view of the attitude which would regard religion as every man's private affair. His view of this attitude is that it is equivalent to our paying no attention to religion, which will disappear of itself. But nothing disappears of itself in society. As early as in the days of Marx, we find the latter in a brilliant essay, Critique of the Gotha Program, poking fun at the Gorder view of religion, a private matter of, yeah, of religion, a private matter. Marx considers this slogan to mean merely that the workers must demand of the bourgeois state that it shall not poke its police nose into things that do not concern it. But it by no means signifies that the workers are to be tolerant of all the remnants of the wretched past, of all the powers of reaction. We may not regard Gorder's point of view on this subject as at all revolutionary or communist. It is a genuinely social democratic point of view. We now turn our attention to philosophy, which is a meditation on the most abstract question, a generalization of all knowledge, a science of sciences. When the sciences had not yet developed or been differentiated from each other, philosophy and religion, from which it had not yet parted company, also embraced purely scientific questions, including that fragmentary knowledge of nature and man that was available at the time. But even after the various sciences began to exist independently, philosophy still retained a field of its own, namely the common element of all the sciences and particularly the subject of man's knowledge and of its relation to the world, etc. Philosophy must coordinate science in spite of the latter's manifold subdivision, must furnish a common framework for all the things that are known, serving as a foundation to the total view of life. At the beginning of this book, we discussed the questions of causality and teleology, which is not specifically a question of physics or political economy or philolo phil philology <laughs> or stati statistics, but a universal concern of all the sciences. A philosophical question. Similar is the question of the relation between mind and matter. In other words, thought and being the individual sciences do not give special attention to this question, but it concerns them all, as do also tech questions as, do our senses correctly reflect the outer world? Does this world exist as such? What is truth? Are there limits or not to our knowledge? Etc. As each science classifies and systematizes the ideas connected with its domain, so philosophy continues to assemble and systematize our total knowledge from a single point of view, thus creating an orderly structure of the whole. Philosophy might therefore be said to occupy the highest place in the human spirit, and it is more difficult to trace its earthly and material origin than in the case of, our, of other subjects. Yet here again, we may ascertain the same basic law of nature. The final dependence of philosophy on the technical evolution of society, the level attained by the productive forces. Inevitably, we here encounter a complicated form of such dependence, for philosophy does not issue forth directly from technology, being separated from the latter by a number of links. A few examples will make this clear. We have stated that philosophy systematizes knowledge, the general results of the individual sciences. It therefore is directly conditioned by the stage at which these sciences stand. If for any cause the social sciences develop, philosophy will shade off in that direction. But if at the given time the natural sciences engage the general attention, the fundamental note of philosophy will be quite different. These results are produced by the social psychology, the general mental attitude prevailing in the given time and place, which is in turn an expression of the alignment of classes, the conditions of their existence. These conditions of existence in general are governed by the situation of the classes in the social economy, and the latter is the result of the given level of the productive forces. We thus find a number of links interposed between the productive forces, technology, and philosophy. If a certain philosophic doctrine is gloomy in its nature, a pessimistic philosophy, or asserts the impossibility of all knowledge, or the vanity of all things, 
their frail and transitory nature, we must look for an explanation to the current psychology from which such a philosophy is born. Detailed investigation will show that such gloomy thoughts do not arise independently, but that they must express a defeat of some section or class of society, or of all classes of society. There seems to be no escape. The love of life has been lost. A gloomy philosophy is the product of this mood. Or, suppose a certain society is involved in a passionate struggle between the classes and their parties. This condition will be reflected in the philosophy of the period, for man does not lead a double life. It is the same man or the same class that is engaged in the political struggle and cogitating on the final cause of things. Such social struggles will place their stamp on the psychology and be reflected in the sublimest constructions. Or, if we assume a society whose tempo has become excessively slow, life creeping along monotonously day by day, today another yesterday, tomorrow another today, etc., tradition, routine, time-honored precedent, controlling all things, no changes in technology and social life and science, men die, other men are born, with thoughts precisely like those of their predecessors, etc., such a rigidity of a whole society will necessarily cause its philosophy to be based in general on the notion of immutability, of permanence. The causal chain may be traced back as follows. A philosophy of inertia, a science of inertia, a social psychology of inertia, a technology of inertia. Examples might be multiplied, but we consider that the ultimate dependence of philosophy on the social economy and technology has been proved. The entire history of philosophic thought will support the above. In ancient Greece, usually considered the classic home of philosophy, the earliest philosophical systems arose in the Ionic commercial cities. These cities lay on the great maritime routes between Asia Minor and Europe. The meshes of economic relations with Egypt also centered here. More than anywhere else in the world, as then known, 6th and 5th centuries BC, trade, artisan work, and slave industry, particularly trade, were developed here. Together with economic intercourse with other countries, there was an exchange of ideas, influence of Babylon, Egypt, cultural life flourished. We have the beginnings of the natural sciences, astronomy, geometry, arithmetic, medicine. On this basis, the first philosophical systems also grew up <clears throat> so-called natural philosophy, i.e. a philosophy connected with the natural sciences, its task being to find the natural basis of all being. The Ionic school, um, Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, and their disciples, sought the unity of matter now in water, now in air, now in infinity, etc. In addition to their observations on the essence of things, we find many scientific observations among these philosophers. Anaximander, for example, devised a geographical map that remained in use for some time. In the Ionic school, philosophical thought was not yet separated from scientific observations connected with practice. We then find a growth of wealth, its accumulation, an increase of slave labor, of parasitism in the higher classes of society, simultaneously an increased contempt for labor, for the life of the worker, for production, for a direct engaging in trade, not through employees. All this retarded the development of scientific technical thought transforming philosophy into a thoroughly unworldly speculation, but it does not follow that philosophy therefore developed out of itself. It continued to be shaped and conditioned by the social life. For instance, let us consider the philosophy of one of the greatest Greek philosophers, Heraclitus, or Her Heraclitus of, Ephes of Ephesus. <clears throat> He was born in a rich commercial city which had passed through many tribulations, wars, civil wars, etc. In the era of tyrants, Ephesus was as much torn by internal dissension as any other Ionic city. The commercial 
aristocracy had struck deep roots here and was politically dominant over the agrarian aristocracy. Heraclitus was of an old noble family which had retained feudal royal traditions, and he was, if not a partisan of the aristocrats, yet a fanatical opponent of the democracy of rule by the blind mob. Being a counter-revolutionary, he shunned politics himself, and he even expounded his philosophy in a particularly obscure, semi-conspirative -cons language. One is worth tens of thousands for me, if he is the best one, he wrote. What manner of sense and reason have they, the present rulers? They run after minstrels and permit the mob to teach them, since they know not that most men are evil and few good. Rather than all other things, the best choose a single thing, namely, eternal fame among mortals. But the mob feed themselves like cattle. It is to this principle of the persecuted arist aristocracy of birth that we must trace the philosophy of Her Heraclitus. <clears throat> born among turbulent transformations and dissensions. Society, torn by many conflicts, nevertheless exists as a whole with all its contrasts and confusions. Such is the universe also. The essence of each thing consists in the fact that it is a whole and not a whole, concordant and discordant, constructive and destructive, one consisting of all and all of one. It is precisely in these contrasts that we have the unity, the essence of things. It is folly to speak of peace when there is no peace. One cannot have peace when the enemy prevails. Therefore, war is father and king of all things. He has made some men gods, others men, some slaves, others free men. Homer, who wished to see struggle eliminated from among gods and men, was not aware that he was thus renouncing all new birth. It is absurd to speak of peace when all is in commotion and change. As a matter of fact, there is nothing rigid and immutable. We cannot step into the same river, forever different water flows along. We hear it said everywhere that the present order is good, but truth is relative. The ocean is the purest and the impurest water, potable and beneficent for or beneficent for fishes non-potable and ruinous for men. It matters not that merchants and democratic upstarts now rule the city. We must not regard only the surface of things, but must penetrate below the surface. The sense is deceived, even the eye, a better witness than the ear. Changes are constantly maturing in life. What exists must perish. Fire lives through the death of earth, air through the death of fire, water lives through the death of air, earth through the death of water. Not, not only are the classes constantly succeeding one another, but social things also are constantly changing place. Everything is exchanged against fire and fire against everything, as commodities against gold and gold against commodities. The essence of society is this substance of gold, which can purchase everything, the omnipresent and impenetrable power of gold. Therefore, fire, the incarnation of this force, is the essence of things, the life-giving force from which all else emanates. The life spirit also, the soul, is fire and warmth. Market competition, war, are elemental in nature. They are a compulsory and omnipotent fate. Therefore, God also is not a human being with curly hair, but a fleshless, inevitable, universal law, the predestined compulsion of fate, imposing its eternal regulations, its measures on all things, which they may not exceed without falling forfeit to the Arrhenius, the handmaidens of justice. But divinity, reason, logos, fate, ruling the world, will ultimately reestablish justice, which has been crushed to earth. The day of judgment will come when fire will fall upon all things and seize and judge them. Justice will take hold of the architects and witnesses of falsehood. We can thus see the factors of the social life of his times peering through the philosophy of Heraclitus, woven in a peculiar pattern peculiar pattern. 
The nature of the economy developing under the banner of gold, the class struggle, the aristocracy as an opposition party, the hope for a better future, words of encouragement, faith and victory, support for this faith in the fact that all things are changing, the assumption of an impersonal destiny and a mysterious reason ruling the world. These reflections of the laws of a commercial world with competition and warfare, rejecting productive labor, the aristocrats by birth hating the mob, the traditions of the nobility and the feudal warrior caste, etc., etc. These are the social roots of Heraclitus's philosophical constructions. Quite characteristically, while Heraclitus, a member of the opposition and representing the aristocracy, and therefore not interested in preserving the existing order of things, was defending the principle of change, of contradictions, of struggle, of dynamics. The philosophers of the other, the ruling school, were with equal vigor defending the principle of immutability and permanence. The greatest of these philosophers was Permenides. Anaxagoras, a close associate of the leader of the Athenian commercial democracy in the 5th century, Pericles, and the official state philosopher of Athens, so to speak, made a very ingenious attempt to shift the center of gravity of this passionate philosophical dispute. The Hellenes, he taught, have no right to speak of rising and passing away, for existing things clearly show that what is present now is produced by mixture and elimination. In other words, Iaxagoras represents the point of view of gradual evolution, which is precisely what we should expect from the social position of his class. Anaxagoras, by the way, among his other ideas, also did much to advance the atomic theory. We cannot dwell in detail here on Greek philosophy. It was manifestly incapable of finding a solution by making it up of whole cloth and elaborating intangible impressions of social life, which was meanwhile becoming more and more confused. The extremely complicated struggle and the very restless condition of the leading cities produced numerous currents, disputes, and criticisms. The social ties, standards, and traditional mor morals were falling into decay. Many were becoming confused. Parallel with this tendency, the whole of philosophy accomplished a sudden shift in the direction of a so-called practical philosophy, i.e. considerations concerning the nature of man, morality, etc. Instead of investigating the essence of the universe, attention began now to be given to the essence of man, of standards of conduct, of duty, of good and evil. On the one hand, we have the sophists subjecting everything to their criticism. On the other hand, Socrates. We have already mentioned at the beginning of this book, the greatest philosopher of slaveholding antiquity, a man of outspoken black hundred tendencies, Plato, with his perfected system of philosophical idealism, incorporating at one and the same time, pure reason and the God, as well as the big stick for the slave and pure reason and the good, as well as the big stick for the slaves. We may take another example. From the period of the decay of the Roman Empire, simultaneously a period of decay of the entire ancient Mediterranean civilization, the cities grew with tremendous rapidity. Commodities were accumulated by plundering colonies and exploiting slaves. The ruling class was absolutely parasitic, as were also the great numbers of free lumpen proletariat corrupted by state elms. The slaves were oppressed as never before. Such, in broad outline, is the internal situation. Seneca, a philosopher of the Stoic school, a rich man, imparts the philosophy of life to his friend Lucilius. What is there that can tempt you away from death? You have tasted all the enjoyments that might make you hesitate. None of them are strange to you. You have had your fill of all. You know the taste of wine and of honey? Is it not a matter of indifference to you whether 100 or 1,000 bottles of them pass down your throat? Also, you have tasted oysters and crabs. Thanks to your splendid living, nothing remains untasted for you in the years that are to come. And can you separate yourself from these things? What is it you may still have to regret? Friends? Home? Do you really value them so highly that you would sacrifice yourself for them to the extent of postponing your supper hour? Oh. Had it been in your power, you would have extinguished the sun itself, for you have accomplished nothing worthy of the light. Confess it. 
You are hesitating to die, not because you will be sorry to leave the curia, the forum, or the beauties of nature. You are merely sorry to leave the flesh market, and yet you have already tasted all its supplies. This is a philosophy of absolute individualism, of persons recognizing no social ties, a pessimism, an advocacy of death, a fruitless criticism of all social institutions, a worship of abstract reason which despises all things. Such is the philosophy of the time. Is it not a faithful reflection of the psychology of an overstated, decaying, parasitic class which has lost all taste for life? This psychology is an outcome of the social economic conditions prevailing at the time. In the Middle Ages, the dominant system in Europe was that of feudalism, with a huge hierarchy of subjection. The church also was constructed along these lines. Standards of law, manners, religion, all these forms of the superstructure were expressive of the system and served to consolidate it. It is obvious how significant a role must here be played by religion, for the foundation of religion is a relation of domination and subjection. Consequently, particularly on the firm foundations of feudalism, a system of religious spiritual serfdom necessarily and, ine and inevitably flourished. Therefore, philosophy also is distinctly religious in tone. It served as the maidservant of divinity. The typical orthodox philosopher of the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, clearly reflects the feudal conditions in his philosophy. The world is divided into two portions, the everyday visible world and the forms inhabiting it. The highest and purest form is God. In addition to God, there are certain particular specific forms arranged according to certain degrees of dign dignity or rank, angels, the souls of men, etc. This entire philosophical system is based on the idea of constancy, of tradition, of authority. St step by step, as the bourgeoisie developed, there also developed an immense advance of science. Astronomy, mechanics, physics, anatomy, physiology again received attention. The bourgeoisie needed, in order to develop its indus industrial production, a science that would investigate the properties of natural bodies and the mode of operation of natural forces. Hitherto, however, science had been only the humble handmaiden of the church. Now science rebelled against the church. The bourgeoisie needed science and joined in the rebellion. These needs for further growth were even reflected in cases where an agrarian ar aristocracy was at the helm. Thus, in England, the first harbinger of the great upheaval in the entire conception of the, or, in the entire conception of the universe, and consequently in philosophy also, was Lord Francis Bacon. Bacon held the nature held that nature should be studied in order to be controlled. For this, we need above all the art of invention. The old scholastic nonsense and even Aristotle must be thrown into the scrap heap. Now. The old is done for. Reason is victorious. Marx considered Bacon as the founder of English materialism. For him, natural science was true science, and the physics of the senses was the most distinguished part of natural science. In his teaching, the sciences cannot deceive us. They are the source of all knowledge. Science means experimental science. It consists of the application of a rational method to that which is perceived by the senses. Induction, analysis, comparison, observation, experiment are the principal conditions for a rational method. Among the properties inherent in matter, motion is the first and foremost. But Marx also discovers many theological inconsistencies in Bacon. In view of the period and the point of view of Bacon's class, we could not expect any other condition. French materialism in the 18th century declared war most emphatically on the feudal conception of the universe and the field of philosophy, just as the bourgeoisie was declaring war on feudal society in the field of politics and economy. This materialism supported and energetically expounded the doctrine of the English philosopher Locke, according to which man has no innate ideas, all the psychical elements in man being merely a modification of feeling, this phase of the doctrine is termed sensualism. 
feeling is declared a property of matter. Simultaneously, Locke believed in the omnipotence of human reason and of rationalism, the whole being permeated with an individualism that is also found expressed in the field of practical philosophy, the rights of the individual, the freedom of the individual, etc. The philosophy, extremely revolutionary in its time, is an outgrowth of the revolutionary position of the bourgeois of the period, which was destroying the feudal world, its traditions, its church, its religion, and its theological and conservative philosophy. The revolutionary attitude of the bourgeoisie may easily be explained by the social economy of the 18th century and by the conditions of the productive forces, which had encountered in the feudal system a great obstacle in their development, and which, operating through the bourgeoisie, the petty bourgeoisie, the artisans, and the semi-proletarians, were obliged to break down these barriers. In order to make the dependence of philosophy on the course of social life even clearer, we shall consider as our final example the philosophy of the bourgeoisie in the period of its decay, after the imperialist world war of 1914 to 1918. The great crisis of the war, the crisis in economy, the social crisis which is bringing about a collapse of capitalism before our eyes, shattering its entire cultural structure to its very foundations, is producing among the ruling classes a psychology of despair, of profound skepticism, of pessimism, a lack of confidence in one's own forces, and the power of the intellect in general. This results in a return to mysticism, a seeking for the mysterious, an inclination toward occult rites and ancient religions, by the side of a reawakening of the modern form of parlor magic, spiritualism. In many of its traits, this philosophy recalls that of the ruling classes in the declining period of the Roman Empire. We shall close with a few specimens of this philosophy, characteristic of the collapse of capitalism. Paul Ernst is our first example. Ernst offers a criticism of the capitalist organization which led to war. This blind organization oppressed the individuality of man. Whence can a change come? There is but one way. Humanity must bethink itself of itself. It must become aware of the fact that the most distinguished task imposed upon it by God is that of setting goals for itself and its actions. Ideal wisdom, says Ernst, is found in China. We must attain clarity on the point that the foundations for the sufferings of men do not lie in institutions, but in the attitude creating institutions. Why has capitalism never succeeded in gaining a foothold in China? For the simple reason that the Chinese loves and honors agricultural work and always succeeds in obtaining the little parcel of land that he needs and can produce on it what is required for his simple tastes. We want um, nor reforms or revolutions, but an introspective return to true morality. The ultimate source of all the goals are men of a higher order. The highest of our metaphysical thought we owe to men who lived naked in the in the four forests in India and nourished themselves on grains of rice, begged by their disciples. Therefore, we are to infer, according to Ernst, that the highest forms and methods of knowledge are those devised by men who have sucked the divine wisdom from their own thumbs. The highest forms of life are those of the Chinese peasant and his virtuous spouse. The solution offered by present-day philosophical thinking is a flight from civilization, which has run into a blind alley. Hermann Kaiserling says in his <laughs> Rise the Tega book, or Rise the Tega Butch, Enes Philosophen, all truth is, in the last analysis, symbolical. The sun more correctly expresses the character of the divine than does the best formulation of a conception. Therefore, all the worshippers of God are right in the eyes of God. The author is not joking. He is serious. The divine reveals itself to man everywhere in the frame of his intimate prejudices. According to Kieserling, the Hindu fakirs are the ideal in faith and knowledge, for there is no cruder superstition than the belief in the insurmountable character of natural determinism. Man is spirit in his profoundest essence, and the more he recognizes this, the more firmly he believes it, the more of his fetters will fall away from him. 
It is therefore possible that, as in the Hindu myth, perfect knowledge may even overcome death. And he who is perfectly instructed, he who is of spiritual practices, utilizes faith according to his desire as an instrument. So far had gone the greatest among the Indians. They knew that all religious formations were of human origin, but they sacrificed now to this God, now to that, devout in their hearts, knowing well that this practice is useful to the soul, etc., etc. Oswald Spangler says, in Der Untergang <laughs> des Abendlands, Jesus. Systematic philosophy is today infinitely remote from us. Ethical philosophy has reached its termination. There is still a third possibility corresponding to Hellenic skepticism within the Western mentality. This is a skeptical history of philosophy. Spengler considers the entire history of humanity and puts the idea of fate in the place of the idea of causality. It devolves upon each society, according to Spengler, to accomplish a cycle, running from youth to age and terminating in death. The European cultural cycle has exhausted its creative powers and is on the downward path. Our task is to predict this downward motion and adapt ourselves to the inevitable. The bourgeois philosophers, like the oversatisfied Roman higher bureaucrats and the effeminate noble sages, make journeys to foreign countries in quest of men going about naked in order to learn the, the great secret. Spengler predicts the fate of the Roman Empire for Europe, but he is reckoning without his host. While his glances have been turned to India and China, he has been blind to the proletariat at home. While in ancient times the lower classes were only capably are capable of bringing about the philosophy of Christianity, we now have Marxian communism which cannot but gain strength in the ruins of the Abendland. This communism has its own philosophy, a philosophy of action and battle, of scientific knowledge and revolutionary practice. We thus are again led to conclude that philosophy also is not a thing that is independent of social life but that it is a quantity that changes in accordance with the changes in the various phases of society, i.e. in the last analysis with the changes in economy and technology. We shall now take up another order of social phenomena, art. Art is as much a product of the social life as is science or any other outgrowth of material production. The expression, objects of art, will make this apparent. But art is an outgrowth of the social life in the further sense that it is a form of mental activity. Like science, it can develop only at a certain level of productive labor, in default of which it will wither and perish. But the subject of art is sufficiently complicated to justify an investigation of the manner in which it is determined by the course of social life. The first question requiring an answer is, what is art? What is its fundamental social function? Science classifies, arranges, clarifies, eliminates the contradictions in the thoughts of men. It constructs a complete uh, raiment of, soci of scientific ideas and theories out of fragmentary knowledge. But social man not only thinks, he also feels. He suffers, enjoys, regrets, rejoices, mourns, despairs, etc. His thoughts may be of infinite complexity and delicacy. His psychic experiences may be tuned according to this note or that. Art systematizes these feelings and expresses them in artistic form, in words or in tones, in gestures, for example the dance, or by other means, which sometimes are quite material, as in architecture. We may formulate this condition in other words. We may say, for example, that art is a means of socializing the feelings. Or, as Leo Tolstoy correctly says in his book, art is a means of emotionally infecting men. The hearers of a musical work expressive of a certain mood will be infected, permeated with this mood. The feeling of the individual composer becomes the feeling of many persons, has been transferred to them, has influenced them. A psychic state has here been socialized. The same holds good in any other art painting, architecture, poetry, sculpture, etc. The nature of art is now clear. It is a systematization of feelings and forms. The direct function of art in socializing, transferring, disseminating these feelings in society is now also clear. 
What conditions the development of art? What are the, form the forms of its dependence on the course of social evolution? In order to answer these questions, we must analyze an art. We have selected music for this purpose into its component parts. Our investigation will show the following elements. One, the element of objective material things, the musical technology, musical instruments and groups of musical instruments, orchestra, quartet, etc. The combination of instruments may be likened to combinations of machines and tools and factories. Also, physical, sim physical symbols and tokens, systems of notation, musical scores, etc. Two, the human organization. These include many forms of human association and musical work, distribution of persons in the orchestra, the chorus, and the process of musical creation, also musical clubs and societies of all kinds. Three, the formal elements of music, including rhythm, harmony, corresponding to symmetry in the graphic and plastic arts, etc. Four, the methods of uniting the various forms, principles of construction, what corresponds to style in some arts, in a broader sense, the type of artistic form. Five, the content of the artwork, or if we are dealing with an entire movement or tendency, the content of all the works. We are chiefly concerned here not with the method of performance, but with its sub substance. Let us say with the choice of subject of presentation. Uh, six, as a superstructure of the superstructure, we may also include in music the theory of musical technique, theory of counterpoint, etc. Let us now consider the various causal relations between the evolution of music and social evolution in general, which is ultimately based on the economic and technical evolution of society. First, we shall not again emphasize the fact that art may not, may not flourish before a certain level has been attained in the productive forces of society. Second, only in a certain social atmosp atmosphere may art, and specifically music, be singled out for development from among the innumerable forms of the superstructure. For example, in discussing the question of technology and art among the Greeks in the 5th and 4th centuries BC, we found that there was no growth of technical or natural sciences at all, but that philosophical speculation was widespread. There is no doubt that, that the superstructure in general rises at a, at a fast pace if social technology is moving at a, at a fast pace. But there is also no doubt that the, super, that the superstructure does not move forward or backward uniformly, nor does material production advance uniformly. For instance, the manufacture of sausages may not keep abreast of the evolution of the productive forces to the same extent as the construction of locomotives or the production of castor oil. Certain forms of production usually develop much faster than others. In fact, some such forms may be entirely absent for certain reasons. The superstructure shows the same conditions. In Athens in the 5th century BC, technology fared badly while speculative philosophy flourished. In America in the 20th century, technology is supreme and philosophy is neglected. Church hymns, a brand of the general field of music, were once universal, but it would be difficult to find many persons today except a few moldy old men and pious old women who are fond of the conventional hymns. The mental shoots of society are the highest outgrowth of the superstructure, and we naturally expect that shoot to burgeon that, ha that happens to receive the most generous supply of sap. In ancient Athens, it was an ignoble thing, worthy only of stupid artisans to concern oneself with an investigation of nature by means of experiment. The disfavor in which the natural sciences were held is easy to understand. It was, it was a result of the class alignment of the social economy, which in its turn was conditioned by the social technology. Similarly, in the case of music, hymns might be quite important at an epoch when music still when music still the handmaiden, as was also philosophy of religion. But such hymns are as appropriate to a highly developed capitalist society as General Ludendorff's trousers to Father Sergius. 
The function of music in society is therefore dependent on the state of the latter, on society's mood, means, views, feelings, etc. The explanation of the latter is found in the class alignment and the class psychology, which are ultimately based on the social economy and the conditions of its growth. Third, the technique of music depends in the first place on the technique of production. Savages cannot build pianos. This prevents them from playing the instrument or composing pieces for it. It is sufficient to compare the primitive musical instruments, <clears throat> aside from the natural instrument, the human voice, <clears throat> those developed from horn and pipe from the needs of the chase, with the complicated construction of the modern piano, to grasp fully the function of these instruments. Music is not possible as an independent art until appropriate tools have taken shape and developed, the instruments and their development. Music can express the gamut of emotions only when the scale of the available instruments, only, only within the scale of the available instruments. The production of such things as the telescope and the piano are a portion of the social material production. It is obvious that musical technique, now meaning the instruments, depends on the technique of this material production. <coughs> Fourth, the organization of persons is also directly connected with the basis of the social evolution. For instance, the distribution of the members of an orchestra is determined precisely as in the factory, by the instruments and groups of instruments. In other words, the arrangement and organization of these members is here conditioned by musical technique, in our restricted sense of the word, and through it, based on the stage and social evolution, on the technique of material production as such. Similarly, the organization of persons in another musical field, let us say, a musical society, is the result of a number of conditions of social life, principally a love of music. <clears throat> Resulting from the social psychology, as above discussed, the opportunities afforded the various classes to indulge this predilection. For instance, the amount of unoccupied time available to the various classes, i.e. the class alignment and the degree of productivity of social labor, which elements govern the number of members, the extent and nature of their activity, the character of the membership, etc., or in the case of the creative process, we also find a number of forms for the human relations involved, the oldest of which is the impersonal stage. Individual names are not handed down, the so-called folk songs. <clears throat> Here, the artwork is produced in an elemental manner by thousands of nameless artists. Quite different is the case when the individual artist works on order by the command of a prince king or wealthy man. The case is again different when the artist works as an artisan for an unknown market on whose caprices he depends. An artistic production may also result when the latter assumes the form of a social service, etc. These forms of human relations are obviously based directly on the economic structure. In the slaveholding system, the musicians were slaves. Not so long ago, we still had surf musicians in Russia performing and composing not to satisfy a market requirement, but at the command of a feudal magnate. Of course, these elements are expressed in the artwork. <clears throat> Fifth, the formal elements, rhythm, harmony, etc., are also connected with the social life. Many of these elements are already present in prehistoric times, even in the animal kingdom. Carl Bucher says, Concerning rhythm among horses, rhythm springs from the organic nature of man. Every normal use of his animal body he seems to control as a regulating element of economic utilization of energy. The trotting horse and the leading camel move as rhythmically as the rowing fisherman and the hammering blacksmith. Rhythm awakens a feeling of well-being. It therefore not only renders work easier, but is a source of aesthetic pleasure and the element of art to which all persons respond, regardless of their mental nature. Quite true, but rhythm has also developed, as Bucher points out in his work, 
under the influence of social relations and particularly under the direct influence of material labor. The workers' songs, like the Russian Dubin Dubinushka, arose on the same basis. Rhythm here is an instrument of labor organization. In other words, while the formal, such as rhythm, may have arisen in prehistoric times became man, they do not evolve from within them, but under the influence of social evolution. A further circumstance is worth mentioning. At a certain stage of, de of development, only the simplest rhythms are available to man, as monotonous as, as the singing of cannibals. He has no ear for the complicated rhythm perceived by man at a different stage of, de of development. A.V. Lunikarski, in one of his essays on art, says, From all of the above, i.e. the determining role of economy, it by no means follows that the forms of creative work may not have their own imminent psychophysiological laws. They have such laws and are entirely conditioned by them in their specific form, while the content is given by the social environment. We learn later on what is meant by this. The imminent psychological law of evolution in art is the law of complication. Impressions of similar energy and intricacy begin, after a number of repetitions, to exert less and less force on the mind and to be capable of suggesting a lower intricacy. We experience a sense of monotony, of boredom. It gets on my nerves. It follows that every school of art will naturally seek to make more complicated and to enhance the effects of its works. We thus find the psychophysiology -physio contrasted with the economy. The content is left to economy, the form to psychophysiology. This point of view seems to us to be at least insufficient, if not wrong. As a matter of fact, if we consider the ev evolution of those elements that we regard as formal, we shall find that this evolution has by no means proceeded at a uniform rate. The music of the savage, the number of harmonious tones produced by him, was very poor, yet the social evolution itself was not characterized by great speed. Manifestly, the musical supply lasted for a long time, did not produce boredom for a long time. Antiquity did not know our modern har harmony and made use of unison arrangements. It took a long time for it to become accustomed to the octa octave. We have reason to believe that it is only recently that the fourth has been recognized as a harmonic interval. Therefore, the formal elements become more complicated as a consequence of the more complicated structure of life, for an increasing intricacy of life alters the psychophysiological nature of man. The crude hearing of the savage is as much a function of social evolution as is the fine hearing of the inhabitants of the great capitalist cities with their extremely delicate uh, nervous organization. The imminent laws, therefore, are merely another phase of the social evolution. And since the social evolution is conditioned by the evolution of the productive forces, they constitute in the last analysis a function of these productive forces. For man alters his nature in accordance with his influence on the external universe. Sixth, the type, the style, is also conditioned by the course of social life. It embodies the current psychology and ideology. It expresses those feelings and thoughts, those moods and beliefs, those impressions, those current forms of thought that are in the air. Style is not only external form, but also embodied content with its corresponding objective symbols. The history of the styles is an expression of the history of the systems of life. The style of form is a reflex of the social vitality. The religious music of the ancient Hindu hymns, the Vedas, have not the same style or construction as, let us say, a French music hall song or the battle song of the revolution, the Marseillaise. These productions are the outgrowth of different environments, different social soils, and their form is consequently different. The religious hymn, the battle song, the vaudeville song, cannot be composed or constructed in the same way. Even their form expresses different feelings, thoughts, and views. 
This difference is a result of the difference in the situation of the societies or classes involved, and this difference is conditioned by the economic development and, consequently, by the state of the productive forces. Furthermore, the style depends also in high degree on the material conditions of their specific, of the specific work of art. For, instru for instance, instrumental music is conditioned by the nature of the instrument, as well as by the method of artistic creation. We have already discussed the organization of persons in music, etc. All these phases likewise depend on the fundamental causal relation in social evolution. Seventh, the content subject, almost impossible to isolate from the form, is obviously determined by the social environment, as may be readily seen from the history of the arts. It is obvious that artistic form will be given to what is engaging the attention of men in one way or another at the given moment. The creative spirit is not stimulated by subjects that do not hold its attention, but those things that constitute the central interest of society or of its various classes are given treatment, thus reflecting this general interest in the form of mental labor. There is indeed a certain moral temperature governing the general condition of manners and minds. The artistic family is situated within a larger community, namely the surrounding world, whose taste conforms with that of the school. For the state of morals and of mental life is the same for the public as for the artists. The latter are not isolated men. These statements by Taine are entirely correct, but Taine seems incapable of thinking them out of their ultimate conclusions. Out to their ultimate conclusions, which would lead him into the acceptance of impious materialist, materialistic inferences. We have again and again discussed in another shape this question of the moral of the milieu of which Taine speaks. Both mental life in general, feelings and moods do not develop out of themselves. We know that this social consciousness is the social being, i.e. the conditions of existence of society and its various parts, classes, groups. These conditions also give birth to the various tastes. As a result, the content of art is also determined in the last analysis by the fundamental natural law character of social evolution. Its content is a function of the social economy and therefore of the productive forces. Eighth, musical theory is obviously directly connected with all the foregoing and therefore subject to the movement of the productive forces of society. We have outlined the fundamental chains of causality that exist in music. They do not at all exhaust the subject. In the first place, probably not all of these relations have been enumerated above, and in the second place, there is in addition a mutual interaction of all these elements, resulting in a much more complicated and confused pattern, the general outlines of which, however, follow the scheme above indicated. Nor does it follow that the other arts will show precisely the same pattern as we have traced in the case of music. Earth art, or each art, has certain special earmarks, for instance, the material objects involved in singing are reducted to a minimum. There are notes, but the musical instrument remains the human voice alone. In architecture, the role of the material, the tools, the purpose of the buildings, temple, residence, palace, museum, etc., is of immense importance. The student must not neglect such distinctions, but we shall always find that the following holds good, directly or indirectly. Art is ultimately determined in various ways by the economic structure and the stage of the social technology. At the early technology. stages in its evolution, when human society had barely begun to turn out surplus products, art was in direct contact with practical material life. The earliest forms of art are the dance and music, and so much of poetry as was involved in the combination. The original aim of these arts was was to produce a mood of unity as a preparation for a certain act, a sort of practice or repetition of the act itself. Among certain savage tribes, the council dances, the terrifying war dances, etc., accompanied by the clapping of hands, later also by primitive musical instruments, are examples of such dances. Rhythm developed together with work as a principle of organization, as is excellently shown by the Carl by Carl Bucher, 
the challenging dance of the New Zealanders may be taken as an example. It is accompanied by terrible grimaces and the utterance of threats in order to frighten the opponent. Also the dances and songs representing the chase, fishing, etc. A particularly important part is played by the so-called work song, constructed on the rhythm of the work performed, the text being developed from the sound involuntarily ejaculated in the course of this work. The songs of the shepherds or of the Bedouin, as they direct the steps of the camels on their travels through the desert, etc., these are directly connected with the daily labor of the environment. As society grows and new ideologies arise, as civilization, etc., increases, art, of course, absorbs all these elements and ceases to be directly connected with the material life of production. For instance, as religion develops, music, the dance, etc., become a part of the cult. In Egypt, the ruling classes made a sort of mystery of music. The priests were scholars and musicians. Religious music concerned them chiefly. The enslaved masses had their own music at home in the fields. <clears throat> we find the same condition um, among the East Indians, whose musicians formed a privileged caste, special families of musicians and singers. Among the Syro-Babylonians, whose conditions required them to wage war more frequently than our other nations. Their music is principally military and military religious in character, as suggested by the instruments, cymbals, kettle drums, etc. The earliest musical works of the Greeks, of which we know, were the work songs of shepherds and war songs, songs of victory. Only later, songs of social and family type, laments on the dead, wedding songs, etc. Among the Romans, there were chiefly shepherd and peasant songs. Their instrument was the reed. And war songs, the loud brass instruments, were first introduced by the Romans. The trumpet, tuba, curved horn, uh, litis, a sort of trombone, bucina, etc. Similarly, the other forms of art also have their roots in practice. Primitive painting ornament has its origin in poetry. For example, the ornaments in many cases still suggest the earlier combination of pot and woven basket. Furthermore, the beginnings of painting simultaneously serve as the beginnings of writing. The first step in the development of script were drawings set down to aid the memory. The Bushmen, as well as the East Indians, attempt to record certain visible objects on stone. The hieroglyphic, the hieroglyphic inscriptions of the Egyptians, the Mexican symbols, are above all depictions of objects. Tattooing is closely connected with, the, with this practice. The practice of tattooing of words and syllables developed from more primitive forms. The earliest stage was that of pictorial representations on the human body, tattooings with the purpose not only of securing religious effects, warding off spirits, etc., but also of making known the tribe, the rank, age, etc., of those marked in this manner. Markings for the purpose of producing terror and adornments must also be considered here, since such adornments had the purpose of causing admiration and producing an impression, they were used chiefly in warfare. They include, for instance, the war masks of Germanic tribes, which were used in war according to Tacitus. Here is the germ of sculpture. Architecture is chiefly technical in character, as will be readily understood. Originally, it amounted merely to the construction of material, materially useful edifices. The Greek temple and Gothic spire are both merely the permanent representations of useful wooden constructions. The lovely forms of these were first developed in civil and domestic building and only after their invention employed ecclesiastically on the grandest scale. Of course, the direct influence of production relations made itself particularly noticeable here. In Egypt, the firm construction of the houses with their receding walls was due to the overflowing of the Nile, as such walls were capable of offering more resistance to the rush of waters. 
Columns were used as props before the arch and, and vault were known. In order to show the dependence of form and therefore of style on the social environment, we shall offer a few examples in this field, taking our material chiefly from the interesting investigations of Wilhelm Hausenstein. In the primitive reproductive arts, we may discern two periods, a purely naturalistic period, representing things as they were, on the one hand, and a conventionalized ornamentation and symbolic drawings with little resemblance to reality on the other. In the former case, we have drawings of bisons, horses, mammoths, reindeer, scenes of the chase, etc., found on the walls of caves or drawn on the bones of horses, the teeth of mammoths, or reindeer antler, antlers, etc. In the second period, we have chiefly conventionalized idols and human and animal figures. Max Verworn explains the circumstance as follows. The Paleolithic hunter of the earlier period did not yet possess, as far as we know, the notion of the soul. He looked for nothing behind things, i.e. was not yet an animist. He had no metaphysics, he concerned himself only with what he perceived, fully resembling the Bushmen in this respect. On the other hand, all tribes among whom the conception of the soul and other religious conceptions have gained a control over life, as among black folks, American Indians, South Sea Islanders, we find extremely idioplastic um, art. <laughs> Idioplastic art. <clears throat> Hausenstein observes that Verworn does not pursue the thought to its conclusion. Hausenstein finds the nucleus of the matter in the fact that the hunter is more an individualist, the peasant more of a collectivist. But the fact of the matter is that idioplastic art, like religion, grows with the growth of particular conditions of production namely the relation of domination and subjection. In the feudal era, this relation attains huge dimensions in production, and the gulf between the slave and the despot may indicate the extent of this relation. This condition determines the, sp the specific style of all feudal eras, has brilliantly analyzed by uh, Hausenstein. The power and domination of the divine despots, of mighty feudal kings, of pharaohs, their unattainable sublimity, valor, audacity, etc., as opposed to common mortals. This is the essential point expressed in the feudal styles of the Egyptians, Syro-Babylonians, of the earliest Greeks, Chinese, Japanese, Mexicans, Peruvians, East Indians, as well as in the Romanesque and early Gothic art of Western Europe. Literally, literary, literary examples from the epochs mentioned will support this statement. From the legal code of the Babylonian king Ham Hammurabi, whom we have mentioned before, we take the words, I am Hammurabi, the incomparable king, with the mighty weapon given me by Zemama and Inanna, with the wisdom given me by Ea, with the reason bestowed upon me by Marduk, I have destroyed the enemies to the north and to the south, have terminated dissension, have bestowed prosperity upon the lead. The great gods called me. I am the ben beneficent shepherd. I am Hammurabi, the king of truth, upon whom Shamash bestowed the quality of justice. My words are good, my deeds incomparable, sublime. They are a pattern for the wise to attain fame. The following eulogy of a king is found on an, Egyptian, on an Egyptian tomb. Praise the king in your bodies, bear him in your hearts. He is the god of universal wisdom living in hearts. He is the radiant sun illuminating, illuminating both the earths more than the disk of the sun. He makes more things green than the great Nile. He fills both the earths with power. He is breath giving life. The king is sustenance. Multiplication is his lips. He is the begetter of what is. He is the numb, original father of man. Battle for his name. Meanwhile, in good society, the lower stations were despised. An Egyptian father giving paternal advice to his son 
wants the latter to become a court scribe and speaks of the lower trades as follows. I've never seen a smith serve as an envoy or a jeweler as an ambassador, but I have seen a smith working at his forge. His fingers were like the hide of a crocodile. He spread an odor worse than rotten fish roe. The peasant wears an eternal garment. His health may be compared with that of a man lying under a lion. The weaver in his workshop is weaker than woman. His feet lie against his stomach. He has nowhere to breathe. If he does not complete his daily task, he is beaten like lotus on a swamp. The Egyptian king, Yakimos, says of himself, the Asians approach full of fear and are judged by him. His sword enters into Nubia, the fear of him into the land Feneca. The fear of his splendor is like that of the god Min. Fritz Berger thus characterized the ancient Egyptian, i.e. feudal, art. Um, Egyptian art is an embodiment of the notion of immortality, not as a mere symbol, however, but as a reality, the eternal pyramids of unusual permanence, statues, etc. A powerful suggestion of force emanates from them. They make us bend the knee. They have the awe-inspiring quality of a higher existence incorporated within them. They bear witness to the disciplined strength of life and its dreadful tension, to a superpersonal eternal power whose pride keeps us at a distance to the soulless sev severity of a being that is indifferent to all mere matters of detail. They reflect the brilliancy of their master's light as remote as the stars. Therefore, every feudal civilization carries on a worship of quantity. The huge pyramids, the gigantic monuments of the pharaohs or the Assyrian Babylonian kings are a form of greatness and might. Art is monumental and frontal. The interior decoration of the present-day bourgeoisie would not have sufficed for feudal conditions. The bearing of the figures of rulers is prescribed exactly. Upright stature, not human, but half divine, as opposed to the slaves and ordinary mortals. The ancient Greeks designated the bearing of a slave, etc., by the word proskinesis, i.e. dog-like creeping. One of the best, best specialists on Egypt Ehrman maintains that the human body is represented in a number of different forms in Egyptian painting according to the social rank. It is natural for ordinary mortals, conventionalized for superiors, virile power is represented by a wide chest, not foreshortened as perspective would require. Among the Egyptians, the chest is always given its full width even if the figure stands in profile. The same spirit also prevailed in archaic, feudal, early Greek art, the heroic, energetic power of early Attic art, the severe energy of the Dorians, the so-called Doric style. Approximately the same condition is found among the East Indians, Peruvians, Mexicans, Chinese, and Japanese. When the Mexican Aztecs succumbed to the conquistadors under Hernando Cortes, the style of this kingdom was almost identical both socially and aesthetically with the style of the feudal despotism. In literature, we find in addition to the eulogies of kings and in inscriptions and elsewhere also heroic warlike epics and the heroic knightly drama. Among the Greeks, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Among the Japanese, the knightly drama glorifying the fidelity of the samurai who were the feudal masters. Among the Incas, likewise the heroic drama, etc. A divine sublimity, a crude strength, both inaccessible to ordinary mortals, are expressed also in medieval European art, particularly in the architecture of the cathedrals built in the course of many years by great numbers of unknown persons. Later in the bourgeois epochs, these gloomy and solemn structures began to be designated as citadels of the spirit. The transition from the feudal style to the bourgeois style begins everywhere with the growth of trade of commercial capital or trade. Capitalist relations in the Athens of the 5th century in the Italian commercial city republics of the Renaissance, later in the commercial cities of all Europe, the process was finally completed with a definite collapse of feudalism, i.e. with the victory of the French Revolution. In the place of the masses, held down by the feudal system, by the scale of hierarchic 
relations, we have the bourgeois individual with his commercial calculations, his thoughts of profit, a man and a citizen. In music, the situation is as follows to the 16th century. The community principle prevailed, i.e. in the sense of feudal restrictions, serfdom, but after all a form of organization. The individual was rele relegated entirely to the background. He was absorbed in the family, the community, the church, the guild, or brotherhood, the state. Accordingly, choral music was the prevalent form of the times, but now the individual also wished to make himself felt, i.e. the energetic, vigorous, bourgeois individual, then still young, eager for knowledge, capable of practical calculations, and therefore we find individual singing and the musical drama growing up by the side of the chorus. The new musical style, um, still representativo, i.e. the style of theatrical performances of opera of drama, practically constituted transition to recitative, i.e. half singing. Half conversation, melody, rhythm, etc. all were subordinated to a faithful representation of the words of the text. It is extremely interesting to note the concomitants of the circumstance that this new musical style arose simultaneously in three quarters, writes Coth, so that it is difficult to determine the real inventor. The reader should recall in this connection Bordeaux's remarks concerning the similar condition in science already mentioned in our discussion of that superstructure. The trained merchant replaced the royal feudal religious banner with a desire for the earthly, for the individual human. Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest artists of all times and peoples, and one of the most significant of all humans, magnificently expressed the new tendency of thought in many fields, as a philosopher, inventor, natural scientist, mathematician, an incomparable artist, and even as a poet. Leonardo renounces all mysticism. He reduces the fact of human life to the law of circulation, well known and well drawn by him. With cold cynicism, he analyzes the structural laws of the world of human forms and with an intellectual bruta brutality that is above all sentimentality, he graphically depicts the sexual act. He approaches the problem of light by the path of knowledge. The influence of light and atmosphere on form becomes the problem of experimental optics. The rhythm of graphic composition is for him a geometrical secret. The wonderful panel with St. Anna, the Madonna, the Jesus Child, and the Lamb is doubtless the outcome of very exhaustive mathematical combinations of painful thought concerning the theory of curves. Realism, rationalism, individualism, these are the isms of the Renaissance. In poetry, the path of transition from the medieval Gothic style to the new style is successively marked by Dante, Petrarch, Boccaccio, etc. The content of this art, art is a criticism of feudal churchdom, a rejection of the feudal style in favor of an, of an elegant style of the world, realistic but also personal, individual. The connection with the social life is here clearly evident. Unfortunately, we cannot dwell on all the art forms, for instance, on the Baroque, on which, by the way, we have an excellent Marxian work by Hausenstein. We shall proceed at once to the modern period. Just before the French Revolution, the so-called Rococo style prevailed, the social basis of which was the rule of the feudal aristocracy and the financial oligarchy. Parvenus, who fought ducal and princely titles and adopted aristocratic manners. Positions of tax farmers were sold, manipulations and dubious financial operations were carried on to the stock exchange, commercial and colonial policy, domination by the nobility, which needed money and sold its titles, rich burghers who bought these titles, also purchasing the young scions of the nobility as husbands for their daughters, etc. Such was the environment up above. This environment determined the manners peculiar to this gallant period. Life was dominated by love, not as a powerful passion, but in the form of philandering, which had become the trade of elegant idlers. The ideal type was that of the specialists in deflowering virgins. The frivolous doctrine of the proper moment for this operation constituted practically the spiritual axis of the age. Rococo art, with its delicate and absolutely erotic curves, is a perfect reflection of these traits in the social psychology. 
With the growth of the bourgeoisie, with their battle and victory, a new style was brought forth, the best representative of which is in French painting, David. This style was the embodiment of the bourgeois virtues of the revolutionary bourgeoisie. The ancient simplicity of its forms expressed its content, concerning which Diderot wrote that art must have the purpose of glorifying great and fine deeds, of honoring unhappy and defamed virtue, of branding flagrant vice, and of inspiring tyrants with fear. Diderot also advised dramatists to get close to real life. He himself blazed the trail in literature for the so-called bourgeois drama, which was called Le Genre Honnête. The social roots of this Genre Honnête are perfectly manifest. If, after having viewed a painting by Watteau of the Rococo school, we return to our room and open J.J. Rousseau's Nouvelle Eloise, we shall find we have entered a different sphere. This changed artistic sphere corresponds closely with the changed social sphere. The burger has become the hero in the place of the enervated parlor butterflies of the aristocracy, and he begins to create his genre honnet. For purposes of, purposes of contrast, it would be very interesting to consider the art of the dying bourgeoisie. This art has been expressed with particular sharpness in Germany, where by reason of the mil military collapse and the peace of Versailles on the one hand, and the constant menace of a proletarian uprising on the other hand, the general basic note in the life of the bourgeoisie has become particularly gloomy, where the capitalist mechanism is deteriorating most rapidly, and where therefore the process of unclassing, of transforming bourgeois intellectuals into human riffraff, is rapidly proceeding into individuals thrown from their course by the pressure of great events. This condition of hopelessness is expressed in a strengthening of individualism and mysticism. There is a convulsive grasping for a new style, for new forms of generalization, without any possibility of finding them. Each day brings some new ism, which does not hold the ground for long. Impressionism is followed by neo-impressionism, then by expressionism, etc. A vast number of tendencies and experiments, an accumulation of paper theories, but no reasonably solid synthesis. This may be observed in painting as well as in music, poetry, sculpture, in short, all along the line. Bourgeois reactionaries timidly recording the gradual disintegration of their culture, of their class, formulate this process in some such way as this. A faith in the mysterious is developing, a belief in witchcraft and miracle workers and spiritualism and theosophy. The head of a group of so-called cult devotees writes book after book and delivers lecture after le lecture. Diligent spiritualists, Christian scientists, or theosophists have a lot to say, but are neither moved by the alleged revelations nor moving by their communication. Our latest artists also maintain that what they create is the expression of the contents of visions, and that each artwork consists of ecstatic gestures of the soul. We are asked to consider this as an expression of magic idealism. In poetry, sacrificing the sentence to the word, or even Dadaism, the, the derivation of this name from Dada, the earliest sound produced by infants, is illustrative of the childish attitude characteristic of this tendency. In painting and sculpture, a crude childish trifling. Christian scientists, astrologers, and their ilk distort the admitted fact that wisdom is not exhausted by the logic of syllogisms into a laudation of prenatal um, metaphysics. Little closed groups, cliques, leagues, are promulgated within which the artists surrender themselves to a mysterious contemplation of the hereafter and the joys of this wondrous creation. Together with this tendency, we find an inclination toward emotional communism, an indication of the profound fall of the bourgeoisie as a class. Mysticism is therefore triumphant. Jules Remains requires a state of mystical rapture toward or rapture as a condition for the conquest of the world by art and desoir, having become sufficiently tired of this image, expresses the single hope that this unhealthy mysticism may in some way be healed by a return to the path 
a faith in the God of earlier days. An expressionist theorist, Theodore Doubler, excellently expresses this essentially and profoundly individualist point of view of the disintegrated social atoms. The center of the world is in every ego, even in the ego-justified work. Of course, this point of view leads to mysticism. We hear everywhere pronounced the cry away from nature. It is obvious what this means as far as expressionist poetry and graphic art are concerned, a departure from what is supplied us by the senses, a transcending of the limits of sensuous experience, a tendency to elevate oneself to that which lies behind phenomena. In music, we are led to super music, to anti-music, without harmony, without rhythm, without melody, etc. A general social evaluation of all this business from the point of view of capitalist culture is given by Max Martersteg. The states of rapture produced by the suffering of monstrous things must yield place to reason. No variety of war psychosis or disarmament psycho psychosis may any longer serve as an excuse for fragmentary and, and anarchic work. The author invokes a spirit of highest responsibility, but his invocations will be of no avail, for it is impossible to find a new sublime th synthesis in the decaying temple of capitalism, debris and ruins in incoherent mystical babbling and the ecstasies of theosophical sects will now be inevitable. Such always has been the case in civilizations destined to early extinction. We shall also say a few words on fashions, which have already been touched upon. In certain respects, fashions are related to art in style, e.g. the garments and costumes of the Rococo period corresponded perfectly with Rococo art. In other traits, fashion is connected with standards of conduct, with rules of decency, customs, etc. Fashions, therefore, also develop in accordance with the social psychology, the, the secession of its forms, the rate of change depending in turn on the character of this social development. Here, for instance, we find the roots of the inor inordinately swift changes of fashions at the end of the capitalist period. Our inner rhythmics corresponding to the headlong course of life require shorter and shorter periods for each new impression. Wherein lies the social significance of ions? What is their role in the current of social life? Here is Simmel's brilliant answer. They are a product of the division along class lines, the case being similar to that of a number of other social formations, particularly with honor, having the double function of holding a group together and at the same time keeping it separate in other groups. Thus, fashions on the one hand express one's connection with those of equal rank, the unity of the circle defined by these fashions, and simultaneously the exclusiveness of this group as opposed to those further down in the scale. Language and thought, the most abstract ideological category of the superstructure, also functions of social evolution. It has sometimes been fashionable among Marxists or pseudo-Marxists to, de to declare that the origin of these phenomena has no relation with historical materialism. Kotsky, for example, went so far as to claim that the powers of human thought are almost unchanging. Such is not the case, however. These ideological forms, so extraordinarily important in the life of society, constitute no exception to the other ideological forms of the superstructure in their own or origin and evolution. A preliminary question must first be disposed of namely the, double, the doubt that at once appears in a discussion of language and thought. It is customary to admit that language is a social relation, a, tune, a tool in the intercourse between men, an instrument of cohesion, and that Marx is right when he states that it would be absurd to speak of an evolution of language if men did not speak to each other. But the case with thought seems different, for each individual thinks, has his own brain, and only a mystic could attempt to seek the roots of this individual human thought in society. This objection is based on an incomplete understanding of the close relation between thought and language. Thought always operates with the aid of words, even when the latter are not spoken. 
Thought is speech minus sound. The process of thinking is a process of combining concepts, concepts, which are always dealt with in the form of word symbols. A person who has made excellent progress in a foreign language may begin to think it in that language. In fact, it is easy, easy to find illustrations in the reader's own experience of the fact that the process of thought of rumination is accomplished with the aid of words. This being the case, and if we admit that speech is associated with society in its origin as well as in its growth, it results logically that the same must be true of thought. <clears throat> and the facts show that the evolution of thought has coincided with that of language. One of the most distinguished philolo phil philologists, Ludwig Noir, says, <clears throat> the social activity directed toward a common goal, the most ancient labor of the elders of the clan, is the source from which language and reasoning originated. Human speech is as much an outgrowth of the sounds ejaculated during labor as our music and song. Philology has shown that the original basis of the vocabulary is the so-called action roots, the earliest words being such as designated chiefly in action, verbs. In the later growth of language, objects also received their designations, nouns, insofar as these objects were prominent in the labor experience of man. Such names were given chiefly to the tools used and were developed from the verbal terms for the actions involved. Parallel with this evolution preceded the consolation or consolidation of more definite concepts out of the mass of material which, figuratively speaking, filled man's head, echoed in his ears, appeared before his eyes, etc. But the concept is the beginning of thought. The further evolution of thought and language proceeds along the lines followed by the other forms of the ideological superstructure. Namely, they follow the evolution of the productive forces. In the course of this evolution, the external world ceases to be a world per se, becomes man's world, ceases to be mere matter, becomes material for human actions, instruments of material labor, coarse at first, later more and more delicate, as well as instruments of scientific knowledge, together with the countless feelers such as machines, telescopes, acute reasoning, aids society in its annexation of more and more of this external world to society's sphere of labor and knowledge. A vast number of new concepts and consequently of new words is the result. Language has enriched and is made to include the totality of subjects that constitute the concern of human thought and speech, i.e. of human communication. The fullness of life results in the richness of language. <clears throat> As some shepherd tribes, pure cattle breeders, have no subject of conversation but their cattle, owing to the fact that the low level of their productive forces restricts their entire life to the sphere of production, and their language therefore remains directly connected with the process of production. If, as a result of enhanced productive forces, a huge and complicated ideological superstructure has been erected. Language will, of course, embrace this superstructure also, i.e. the connection of language with the process of production is more and more indirect. The dependence of language on the technique of production is now an indirect dependence. The causal chain now runs through the dependence of the various superstructural forms on the process of production, and even the latter dependence may no longer be a direct one. The increased number of words borrowed from foreign languages is a good example of the manner in which language grows. Such borrowings result from an economy of universal dimensions and the development of a number of practically identical things in many countries, or of events having universal sig significance. <clears throat> telephone, airplane, radio, Bolshevism, common terms, Soviet, etc. It would lead us too far afield to point out in detail that the character, the style of a language also changes with the conditions of the social life. But it is worthwhile to mention that the division of society into classes, groups, and occupations 
also impresses its mark on a language. The city dweller has not the same language as the villager. The literary language is different from common speech. This difference may become so great as to prevent men from understanding each other. In many countries, there are popular, popular dialects that can hardly be understood by the cultured and wealthy classes. This is a striking example of the class cleavage in language, and the various occupations have their special languages. Learned philosophers, accustomed to dwell in a world of subtle distinctions, write and sometimes even speak a language that only their fellows can understand. The desire to indulge in such forms of expression is partly due to the same cause that produces fashions in dress, namely to distinguish these persons from everyday mortals. Thus, a Russian noble landowner would show his class by bringing back with him from Paris clothes of foreign design, an expensive mistress, and an accentuated pronunciation of the letter R. <coughs> Wundt shows that the peculiar intonation of the Puritans also had this social character. They not only took the names of patriarchs and prophets, but even imitated in their speech the chanting tones in which the Bible is still read aloud in the Jewish synagogues. Wundt rightly observes that the phil philologist cannot afford to consider language as a phenomenon that is isolated from human society. On the contrary, our conjectures as to the evolution of linguistic forms must accord with our view of the origin and evolution of man in general, the growth of the forms of social life, the origin of customs and law. Thought has not always followed the same lines. Certain respectable scholars find that science originates in man's mysterious and universal inclination toward causal explanations but they do not consider the question of the cause of this extremely laudable tendency. But we may now consider the mutability of the types of thought to have been definitely established. Thus, Levi Bruhl devotes a whole book. We are quoting chiefly from Professor A. Bogodin's Russian work, Border Regions Between the Animal and Human in New Ideas in Sociology, collection number four, to the mode of thought of savages, which he considers entirely different from the present logical thought, terming it pre-logical. In savage thought, details and specific things are often not distinguished from the general or even the whole. One thing is confused with another. The entire world is not a system of things, but a system of mobile forces, man being one of these. Individual man is not a personality. Personality is absolutely socialized being absorbed in society and not distinct from the latter. The fundamental law of savage thought is not the concept of causal succession, but what Levi Bruhl terms the law of participation. If it is possible to exert an influence on any object under conditions which, from our point of view, preclude such a possibility, the law of participation permits him to shift from the individual to the group and from the group to the individual without the slightest difficulty. Between a bison and bisons in general, between a bear and bears in general, between a reindeer and reindeers in general, this psychology accepts mystical participation. This psychology has no place for the species as an aggregate or for the individual existence of its members. In our sense of these words, Levi Bruhl himself finds a connection between this type of thought and a certain type of social existence in which personality had not yet been differentiated from society, i.e. he connects this stage of thought with primitive communism. Causality, as found among savages, is not our causality, but an animistic causality, the result of the inclination of the savage to seek a spiritual, divine, or demonic principle operative in all situations. All things that come to pass have been ordained by someone. Cause seems identical with a command emanating from a superior spirit. The law of causal succession <clears throat> becomes the whim of the supreme being, the spiritual ruler or rulers of the universe. Therefore, while the tendency to seek causes seems to be present in man, Savage man seeks causes of a specific kind, 
causes emanating from a certain higher power. Of course, this type of thought is also related with a certain social order. It is typical for a society that already shows the presence of a hierarchy in production and social polity. The further course of development presents the same process. It has already been touched upon in our discussion of philosophy. The above examples suffice to show that thought and the forms of thought are a varying quantity and that this variability is based on the variability in the evolution of society, its organization of labor, and its technical backbone. An excellent re recapitulation of this subject is the magnificent formulation made by Karl Marx in his A Contribution to a Critique of Political Economy. In the social production of their lives, men enter into specific necessary relations independent of their wills, production relations which correspond to a certain specific stage in the evolution of their material productive forces. The totality of these production relations constitutes the economic structure of society, the real basis over which there arises a legal and political superstructure and to which there correspond specific social forms of consciousness. The mode of production of material life conditions the social, political, and mental life process in general. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their being, but on the contrary, their social being determines their consciousness. The huge superstructure that arises or that rises over the economic basis of society is of rather intricate internal structure. It includes material things, tools, instruments, etc. The most various human organizations, furthermore, strictly coordinated systems of ideas and forms, furthermore, vague, non-coordinated thoughts and feelings, finally, an ideology of the second degree, sciences of sciences, sciences of arts, etc. <clears throat> we are therefore obliged in a, um, in a precise analysis to resort to a certain definition of terms. We shall interpret the word superstructure as meaning any type of social phenomenon erected on the economic basis. This will include, for instance, social psychology, the social political order, with all its material parts, for example, canons, the organizations of persons, official hierarchy, as well as such phenomena as language and thought. The conception of the superstructure is therefore the widest possible conception. The term social ideology will mean for us the system of thoughts, feelings, or rules of conduct, norms, and will therefore include such phenomena as the content of science, not a telescope or the personal staff of a chemical laboratory, and art, the totality of norms, customs, morals, etc. Social psychology will mean for us the non-systematized or but little systemized systematized feelings, thoughts and moods found in a given society, class, group, profession, etc. So our E, social psychology and social ideology. In our treatment of science and art, law and morality, etc., we were dealing with certain unified systems of forms, thoughts, rules of conduct, etc. Science is a unified, coordinated system of thoughts, embracing any subject of knowledge in its, iron, it, in its harmony. Art is a system of feelings, sensations, forms. Morality is a more or less rigid coordination of rules of conduct giving inner satisfaction to the individual. Many other ideologies may be similarly defined, but social life also includes a great mass of incoherent, non-coordinated material by no means presenting an appearance of harmony, for instance, ordinary everyday thought on any subject, as distinguished from scientific thought. The former is based on fragments of knowledge, on disorderly scattered thoughts. It is a mass of contradictions or incompletely digested notions, freakish conceptions. Only when this material has been subjected to the sharp test of criticism and stripped of its contradictions, do we begin to approach science. But alas, we live in everyday life. Among the countless mutual interactions between men out of which social life is built up, there are many such non-coordinated elements, shreds of ideas, 
yet expressing a certain knowledge, feelings and wishes, tastes, modes of thought, undigested, semi-conscious, vague conceptions of God and evil, just and unjust, beautiful and ugly, habits and views of daily life, impressions and conceptions as to the course of social life, feelings of pleasure or pain, dissatisfaction and anger, love of conflict or boundless despair, many vague expectations and ideals, a sharp critical attitude toward the existing order of things, or a delighted acceptance of this best of all worlds, a sense of failure and disappointment cares as to the future, a bold burning one's bridges, a bold burning one's bridges behind one, illusions, hopes of the future, etc., 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 ad infinitum. These phenomena, when of social dimensions, are the social psychology. The difference between the social or collective psychology and ideology is merely in their degree of systematization. The social psychology has often been apparent in bourgeois society in the mysterious envelope of the so-called popular spirit or zeitgeist, frequently conceived as a peculiar single social soul in the literal sense of the word. But of course, a folk soul in this sense does not exist any more than there can exist a society which is an organism with a single center of consciousness. Society then becomes a huge monster lying in the midst of nature. In the absence of such an organism, we can hardly speak of a mysterious folk soul or a popular spirit in this mystical sense. Yet we do speak of the social psychology to distinguish it from the individual psychology. This apparent contradiction may be answered as follows. The mutual interaction between men produces a certain psychology in the individual. The social element exists not between men, but in the brains of men. The contents of these brains are a product of the various conflicting influences, the various intersecting interactions. No mental life exists except that which is found in the individual socialized human being, who is subject to all such interactions. Society is an aggregate of socialized humans and not a huge beast of whom the individual humans are the various organs. <clears throat> G. Simmel excellently describes this. When a crowd of people destroy a house, pronounce a judgment, utter a cry, we here have a summation of the actions of the individual persons, constituting a single event recognized as a realization of a single conception. A frequent confusion takes place here. The single physical result of many subjective mental processes is interpreted as the result of a single mental process, namely a process in the collective soul. Or, to use another example, when some new and greater thing than their individual aspirations or actions arises from the mutual interaction of men, when examined closely, we find that such cases also involve the conduct of individuals, who are influenced by the fact that each is surrounded by other individuals. This results in nervous, intellectual, suggestive, moral transformations of man's mental constitution as compared with its operation with regard to different situations in which such influences are absent. If these influences mutually interacting produce an internal modification in all the members of the group in a like direction, their total action will no doubt have a different aspect from that of each individual, if each had been placed in a different isolated situation. Yet such words as zeitgeist, popular mood, etc. are not without meaning. They indicate the existence of two conditions that may be noted everywhere. They indicate the real existence, first, of a certain predominant current of thoughts, feelings, moods, a prevailing psychology at any given time, giving color to the entire social life. Second, the alteration of this prevailing psychology according to the character of the epoch, i.e. according to the conditions of social evolution. The prevailing social psychology involves two principal elements. First, general psychological traits, perhaps found in all classes of society, for the situations of the various classes may have certain common elements in spite of class differences. Second, the psychology of the ruling class, which enjoys such prominence in society as to set the pace for the entire social life and subject the other classes to its influence. The former case is illustrated in the feudal eras in which the feudal lord and the peasant present, present certain common psychological traits, love of traditional practices, routine, submission to authority, fear of God, 
general backward ideas, suspicion of innovation, etc. This results from the fact that both classes live in a stagnant and almost inert society. The more mobile psychology is later de developed in the cities. Another cause of this condition is the unlimited authority enjoyed by the feudal lord on his estate and by the peasant in his family. The family then was an organized labor unit. In fact, the labor bond remains an important element in the peasant family to this day. The authority of the feudal lord is therefore found paralleled in the patriarchal order of labor relations in the family, as expressed in the complete submission to the head of the family. The old man knows. At a certain stage of social evolution, the zeitgeist was a cons conservatism of feudal nobility and peasant serf. In addition, of course, the prevailing social psychology also presents factors characteristic of the feudal lords alone, which were disseminated only by virtue of the dominant position of the feudal nobility. Much oftener, however, we encounter cases in which the social psychology, i.e. the prevailing social psychology, is that of the ruling class. In the second chapter of the Communist Manifesto, Marx says, the prevailing ideas of a period have always been simply the ideas of the ruling class. The same might be said of the social psychology prevalent at a given time. Our discussion of ideologies has already shown a number of examples of feelings, thoughts, moods predominant in society. Let us examine a specific case, the psychology of the Renaissance, with its highly developed pursuit of pleasure, its parading of Latin and Greek words, its ingenious erudition, its love of distinguishing one's own ego from the mob, its elegant contempt for medieval superstition, etc. This psychology obviously has nothing in common with that of the Italian peasantry of the same epoch, but was a product of the commercial cities and of the financial cities, of the financial commercial aristocracy in those cities. At precisely this period, the city began to control the provinces. The cities were ruled by bankers, who married into the families of the prominent nobility. The psychology of this class was the ruling psychology. It is expressed in many monuments, literary and other monuments of the epoch. The development of the productive forces among the ruling class causes mighty levers to be fashioned for molding the psychology of the other classes. The three or four metropo metropolitan sheets will, in our future, determine the opinion of the provincial papers and therefore the popular will, is the frank statement of Oswald Spengler, the philosopher of the German bourgeoisie of the present day. Yet it is obvious that no permanent, uniform, integral social psychology may exist in a class society. At most, there are certain common traits whose importance should not be exaggerated. The same applies to so-called national characteristics, race psychology, etc. It goes without saying that Marxists do not, in principle, deny the possibility of certain common traits in all the classes of one and the same nation. In one passage, for instance, Marx even allows for a certain influence of race in the following words. Ugh. The same economic basis, the same in its principal conditions, may present infinite variations and gradations in their manifestation owing to countless different emp empirical circumstances, natural conditions, racial relations, historical influences working from without, etc., which cannot be understood without analyzing this empirically, these empirically given circumstances. In other words, if any two societies are passing through the same stage of civilization, feudalism, let us say, they will nevertheless present certain, perhaps unimportant, special traits these special traits are the result of certain deviations in the conditions of evolution, as well as of the special conditions of evolution in the past. It would be absurd to deny such peculiarities, as it is impossible to deny certain peculiarities in the national character, temperament, etc. To be sure, the presence of a class psychology may, be, may by no means be taken as a proof of certain special national traits. Marx, for instance, spoke of the philosophy of Bentham as a specifically English phenomenon. Engels described the socialism of the economist Rod Burtis as a Prussian junker socialism, etc. 
We may therefore for also agree with Dr. E. Her Her Herwitz, now Canal's companion in arms in the noble task of destroying the Bolsheviks, when he writes, vocational psychology does not exclude the possibility of national psychology, and the psychology of caste does not differ in this respect from the local psychology, neither precludes the possibility of a national psychology. But the facts are these. Marxists explain these national traits on the basis of the actual course of social evolution. They do not merely point at them. In the second place, they do not overestimate these peculiarities or remain oblivious of the forest because of its many trees, while the worshippers of national psychology, etc., lose sight of the forest altogether. In the third place, they do not set down the absurd things cooked up by learned and unlearned babblers and Philistines on the subject of the national soul. Everyone knows, for example, that any Russian Philistines considers Philistinism to be a permanent and immutable quality of the Germans. Yet the German workers are now proving that such is not the case. We all know also how much humbug has been written about the Slavic spirit. When Hurwitz explains with rapture the, that Bolshevism is merely a topsy-turvy Tsarism, that the government methods in both cases are the same, etc., he reveals to us not the properties of the Russian spirit, allegedly responsible for this similarity, but the qualities of the spirit of an international petty bourgeois now serving as a prop to the social democratic parties. The class psychology is based on the aggregate of the conditions of life and the classes concerned, and these conditions are determined by the position of the classes in the economic and social political environment. But the intricacy of any social psychology must not be overlooked. For example, similarities of form may be found in quite different class psychologies. Thus, two classes engaged in a life and death struggle with each other, of course, represent an entirely different con content of feelings, aspirations, impressions, illusions, etc., while the form of their psychology may, quite, may um, be quite similar. Passionate zeal, furious and fanatical aggression, even their specific forms of heroic psychology. The fact that the class psychology is determined by the totality of the conditions of the class life based on the general economic situation should not lead us to ascribe the class psychology to selfish interest, which is a very frequent error. No doubt class interest is the main sinew of the class struggle, but class psychology includes many other elements. We have already observed that the philosophers of the ruling class in the period of the decline of the Roman Empire preached self-extermination with some success, because their preaching was an outgrowth of the psychology of this class, a psychology of repletion, satiety, of disgust with life. The causes for this psychology may be definitely traced. We have already found its roots in the parasitic role of the ruling class, which did not nothing and merely lived in order to consume, to try out, to surfeit itself with all things, as was natural in view of its economic situation, its function or lack of function, and the general economy. The psychology of satiety and necromania was a class psychology, yet we may not say that Seneca, when he preached suicide, was expressing the interest of his class. The hunger strikes in the Tsarist prisons, for example, were acts in the class struggle, a protest in order to fan the flame of conflict. A symbol of solidarity, a device to maintain the ranks of the fighters, and this struggle was dictated by class interests. At times, despair seizes the masses or certain groups after a great defeat in the class struggle, which is, of course, connected with class interest, but the connection is somewhat peculiar. The conflict went on under the impulse of the hidden springs of interest, but now the fighting army has been defeated. The result is disintegration, despair, a longing for miracles, a desire to escape mankind. Thoughts turn heavenward. After the defeat of the great insurrections in Russia in the 17th century, which had taken the form of religious dissent, 
Protest assumed many varied forms under the influence of defeat and despair. Retirement to the wilderness, self-incineration. Hundreds, even thousands, seek their death in the flames. Ecstatic dreamers clothe themselves in pure funereal raiment and lie down in the coffins that have already been prepared to wait for the crack of doom. This psychology also finds expression in the two contemporary po poems quoted by Mel Malgunov. Dear Mother Desert, release me from Earth's sufferings, receive me in your arms. Dear Mother Desert, kind mother, keep me. And Coffin of Pine Wood, there will I lie, waiting for the last trump. It is obvious that the phenomenon of class psychology is of very complicated nature, not capable of direct interpretation as interest only, but always to be explained by the concrete environment in which the specific class has been placed. In the psychological structure of society, i.e. among the various forms of the social psychology, we must not omit to mention the psychologies of groups, occupations, etc. There may be several groups within one class. Thus, the bourgeoisie includes a bourgeoisie of high finance, a trading bourgeoisie, and an, and an industrial bourgeoisie. The working class includes the aristocracy of skilled labor, together with slightly skilled labor and wholly unskilled labor. Each of these groups has special interests and special characteristics. Thus, the highly skilled worker likes his work and is even proud of being superior as a worker to the others. On the other hand, he is ambitious and assumes certain bourgeois inclinations together with his high collar. Each occupation bears its mark. When we berate the bureaucrats, we mean a certain professional psychology of negative virtue. Routine red tape delays, precedence of form over substance, etc. Vocational types of psychology arise, their mental traits a direct result of the character of their activity, whence follows also a corresponding tinge in their ideology. Frederick Engels says, Among the practical politicians and the theorists in jurisprudence, and among the jurists in particular, this fact is first completely lost sight of since in each single instance the economic facts must take the form of juristic motives so as to be sanctioned in the form of law and since therefore a backward view must be taken over the whole existing system of law it follows therefrom in the opinion of these persons that the juristic form appears to be the whole and the economic content nothing at all his trade psychology will quickly betray a man a minute's conversation will tell you whether you are dealing with a clerk, a butcher, a reporter, etc. It is a characteristic fact that all these traits are international. You find them everywhere. By the side of the class psychology, which is the plainest, most pregnant and most significant form of the social psychology, we find a group psychology, a vocational psychology, etc. Being determines consciousness. In this sense, we may say that each grouping of men even in an amateur chess club or chorus imparts a certain sometimes almost imperceptible stamp on its members but since the existence of a certain grouping of persons is nevertheless always associated with the economic structure of society being ultimately dependent on the latter it follows that all the varieties of the social psychology are quantities to be explained by the social mode of production the economic structure of society what is the relation between the social psychology and the social ideology? The social psychology is a sort of supply chamber for ideology, or it may be compared with a salt solution out of which the ideology is crystallized. At the beginning of this section, we stated that the ideology is distinguished by the great coordination of its elements, i.e. the various feelings, thoughts, sensations, forms of which it is composed. The ideology systematizes that which has hitherto been not systematized, i.e. the social psychology. The ideologies are a coagulated social psychology. For example, early in the history of the workers' movement, there was a certain crude discontent among the working class. A sense of the injustice of the capitalist order, a vague desire to replace this system by some other system, we cannot call this an ideology. 
Later, however, this vague tendency was definitely formulated. Things were coordinated, a set of demands, a program platform arose. A specific ideal began to appear, idealism, etc. Here we have an ideology. Or we may find that the discomforts of a situation and the aspiration to cast it off find expression in a work of art. Here also we have an ideology. It is sometimes difficult to draw the line sharply. The actual process is a slow solidification, consolidation, crystallization of the social ideology out of the social psychology. A change in the social psychology will of course result in a corresponding change in the social ideology, as we have pointed out above. The social psychology is constantly changing, simultaneously with the alterations in the economic conditions from which they grow, for the latter bring about a constant regrouping of these social forces, a growth of new relations, based on the successively altered levels of the productive forces, as has been already pointed out. Having given a number of examples in our discussions of ideology, we need not dwell upon the alterations in social psychology as connected with the alterations in ideology. We shall merely point out that the latest books are now devoting consideration or considerable attention to the question of the so-called spirit of capitalism, the psychology of the entrepreneurs. For instance, the works of Werner Sombart, Max Weber, and more recently, Professor Dr. Herman Levy, Marx wrote in the first volume of Capital, Protest Protestant Protestantism, by changing almost all the traditional holidays into workdays, plays an important part in the genesis of capital. Marx repeatedly points out that the bigoted, frugal, parsimonious, and at the same time energetic and persistent mentality of Protestantism, abhorring the pomp and luxury of Rome, is identical with the mentality of the rising bourgeoisie. People poked fun at this statement, but now prominent bourgeois scholars are developing this very theory of Marx, of course without giving credit to its originator. Sombart proves that the most varied traits, avarice for gold, untiring lust for adventure, inventive spirit combined with calculation, reason, sobriety, um, gave rise to the so-called capitalist spirit by reason of their united presence. It goes without saying that the spirit could not have developed out of itself, but was shaped by an alteration in the social relations, parallel with the growth of the capitalist body preceded a growth of the capitalist spirit. All the fundamental traits of the economic psychology are reversed. In the pre-capitalist era, the basic economic notion of the nobility was that of a decent life, according to Station. <clears throat> Money exists in order to be spent, wrote Thomas Equinus. Things were managed poorly, irrationally, without proper bookkeeping. Tradition and routine predominated. The tempo of life was slow, almost every other day a holiday. Initiative and energy were lacking. On the other hand, the capitalist psychology which replaced the feudal chivalrous psychology is based on initiative, energy, briskness, rejection of routine, rational calculation and reflection, love accum of accumulating riches, etc. The complete upheaval in men's minds proceeded simultaneously with the complete upheaval in the production relations. F. The ideological processes considered as differentiated labor. The question of ideologies and of the superstructure in general must also be considered from another standpoint. We have already seen that the various forms of the superstructure are a composite quantity by the nature of their construction and include things as well as persons. The ideologies themselves are a sort of mental product. This being the case, we necessarily consider the forms of the superstructure in their evolution, and consequently also the ideological process as a special form of social labor, but not of material production. The two must not be confused. In the beginnings of human history, i.e. at the time when surplus labor did not exist, we find practically no ideology. Only later, as surplus labor 
arises, a class which is relieved of directly productive labor is formed by the side of the great majority which does nothing but toil. This new class takes care of the common concerns of society, supervision of labor, affairs of state, justice, sciences, arts, etc. Therefore, we find at the basis of the division into classes the law of the division of labor. In one passage, Marx designates priests, lawyers, the ruling classes, etc. as the ideological classes. In other words, the ideological processes may be considered as a specific form of labor within the general labor system. This labor is not material production, nor does it constitute a portion of this material production, but results from the latter, as our study of ideologies has shown, and sets up an independent domain of social activity. The increasing division of labor is an expression of the increasing productive forces of society. Wherefore, the growth of the productive forces conditions also a division of labor and the field of production, accompanied by an isolation of the ideolo ideological labor having its own division of labor. The division of labor is not a characteristic of the economic world. Its growing influence may be observed in the most varied fields of society, in the increasing specialization of political, administrative, legal functions. The same thing may be observed in art and science. We, we may now view the whole of society as a huge working mechanism with many subdivisions of the divided social labor. This great labor aggregate may be divided into two great categories. First, material labor, production as such. Second, the various forms of labor in the superstructure, the work of supervision, etc., as well as ideological labor as such. The organization of this labor goes hand in hand with the organization of material labor and is along the same general lines. It includes a class hierarchy, those holding the means of production being at the top and those without such means at the bottom. In the process of material production, one, those in charge have a special role in this process, which is two, determined by the fact that the means of production are in their hands, and three, they also have control of distribution by virtue of this circumstance. Such also is the case in almost all the branches of superstructural labor. The army has already served as an illustration. The same might be noted in science and art. A great technical laboratory under capitalist society has an internal organization similar to that in the factory. The theater under capitalism has its owner, its manager, its actors, its soups, its technical employees, its clerks, workers, just as in a factory. We consequently find here, i.e. in a class society, various functions socially connected with these persons. The higher function involves, so to say, a possession of the means of mental production, constituting a class monopoly. In the distribution of the products of material production, men live, of course, by consuming material commodities. The possessors of these instruments of mental production obtain a greater share of the social product than their subordinates. We know how firmly the ruling classes have clung to the monopoly of knowledge. In antiquity, the priests who held this monopoly barred the temples of science, to which they admitted but a few chosen ones. Knowledge itself was enveloped in the shroud of a divinely awful mystery, accessible to only a few of the wise and just. The store set by this monopoly by the ruling classes is apparent, for example, from the following words of the well-known German idealist philosopher F. Paulsen. Anyone whose social conditions force him to remain a manual worker by trade and status would not find it a gain to have received the schooling of a scholar. Such training would not enhance but darken his life. The monopoly character of education was the principal reason for the opposition of the Russian intellectuals to the revolution of the proletariat. Conversely, one of the principal achievements of the proletarian revolution was the abolition of this monopoly. An inspection of material production will show that it is divided into a number of branches. In the first place, into manufacturing and agriculture, both of which are further subdivided into a great number of sections, from mining operations and grain growing to the manufacture of pins and the raising of lettuce. 
Here, as in the superstructure, there are large subdivisions, such as those previously considered, i.e. administration, the setting of standards, of science, of art, of religion, of philosophy, etc. Furthermore, each of these subdivisions is further ramified. For instance, science now consists of many branches, so does art. In material production, as we have seen, a certain rough proportion must exist. If society is to go on between the various branches of production, even in a blind capitalist social order with no social plan of production at all, but rather with anarchy in production, i.e. a disproportion between the various branches of production, even here we find a constant adjustment within this anarchy. Violent disturbances of this proportion meet with their reaction. Of course, not without much pain and not for long periods, but there is a certain temporary equilibrium, for otherwise capitalist society would go to pieces as the result of a single industrial crisis. While it is possible for a society to exist in spite of the fact that there is no harmony between its material production and the other forms of its labor, the non-material forms such a society will not grow but decline. For instance, where too much labor is allotted to the maintenance of theaters, the government mechanism or the church or art, the productive forces themselves will decline. It is obvious that this would be the case, for instance, in a community in which there was one worker and seven men supervising and calculating his product, with two others encouraging him by singing and another man governing the whole process. Since all must eat, it is obvious that such a labor system would not endure for long. But it is also quite obvious that, in spite of all the effort the workers might put in, a working community would fare very badly unless its various members formed a coordinated system in which their product was duly tabulated and in which certain individuals took care of relations with the outside world. Therefore, if society as a whole is to endure, there must exist within it a certain condition of equilibrium, though it be unstable, between the material work as a whole and the superstructural work as a whole. Let us assume for a moment that all the scholars, mathematicians, engineers, chemists, physicists, physicists etc., in the United States of America should disappear overnight. The huge production of that country could not go on, based as it is on scientific calculation, but would decline. Let us assume, on the other hand, that 99% of the present workers should suddenly be miraculously transformed into learned mathematicians not participating in production. The resulting bankruptcy would be uh, complete. Society would perish. Not only is a certain proportion, even though its limits be indefinite, necessary in any society between the total material labor and the total superstructural labor, but the, the distribution of labor within the superstructure, i.e. among the various forms of the mental supervising and other activity, is also of importance. As there is a certain equilibrium between the various forms of material labor, these various forms tend to equilibrium, as Marx puts it, so there must be a certain modicum of such equilibrium between the branches of, ide of ideological work, in fact, of the superstructural work in general. The coordination of these ideological branches of production is ultimately determined by the economic structure of society. Why, for instance, was so vast a quantity of national labor in ancient Egypt devoted to the construction of the huge pyramids? great pharaonic states and other monuments of feudal art, for the simple reason that Egyptian society could not have maintained itself without constantly impressing upon the slaves and peasants the sublimity and the divine power of the rulers. In the absence of newspapers and telegraph agencies, art served as the ideological bond. It was therefore a sine qua non for this society and took an enormous share of the country's labor budget. Similarly, ethics, the establishment of moral standards, assumed a very important place in Greece at the end of the 5th century BC, because the question of the relations between men and of the regulation of these relations had become particularly acute, even for the ruling classes, who were impelled by the great gulfs that had opened up to seek to conciliate divergent tendencies. Art is but feebly developed 
in the United States of America of our day, while the same country is a pioneer in the study and application of the science of organized production as a whole. The Taylor system, vocational psychology, psychophysiology of labor, etc. Because American capitalism does not need to resort to art in order to mold the minds of the people, this task is excellently performed by a capitalist newspaper press that has been perfected to the point of virtuosity. The question of a national production, a scientific management, is of immense importance in the life of such a system. A certain proportion between the parts is therefore necessary in the field of superstructural and consequently of any ideological labor, so long as society is in a state of equilibri equilibrium. This proportion between the various branches of mental work and their distribution being determined by the economic structure of society and the requirements of its technology. An interesting application of these observations may be made to the school, which is one of the fields of ideological labor. Indeed, schools, universities, high schools, elementary schools, are the sphere of common social labor in which instruction is given, in which the labor forces are endowed with a certain skill, a specific training, simple human labor power being thus transformed into specific labor power. One person studies medicine, another law, military science, engineering, etc. The same condition of affairs is found throughout the field of instruction i.e. all those special processes in which specific abilities are imparted to men, which are required for the performance of more or less specialized functions. Essentially, there is no difference between the trade school that turns out locksmiths and the educational institution that turns out the, gen the geniuses of the pulpit or the Tsarist cadet school, producing its crack officers. It follows that the school system is division into various branches commercial schools, trade schools, cadet schools, schools of engineering, universities, etc., are an expression of society's need for various kinds of skills, or of skilled material and mental labor. A few examples will clarify our thought. The Middle Ages, the school stood in the sign of the priesthood. Feudal society could not exist without a tremendous development of religion. Therefore, the monastic and cathedral schools and the overwhelming number of chancellor universities, the life in the Bursay, and the instruction in the artistic faculty, all these had a monastic priestly tinge, everything having been devised and arranged according to the ecclesiastical theological spirit. Except the few medical and legal professional schools, the universities, as well as the lower schools, were concerned above all with the training of clerics. In addition, there were schools for training knights. In these, education no longer served to develop priestly labor power, but brightly labor power. The boys were instructed chiefly in seven virtues. These were the seven pro prob probates of the knight six of them being purely physical arts. <clears throat> uh, riding, swimming, archery, fencing, hunting, chess playing, and the remaining one, poetry and music. Obviously, this must have produced a different type of man, necessary for feudal society. But now we have the growth of cities, the commercial bourgeoisie, etc. The result of this condition is well described by Professor Ziegler, whom we have already quoted. But new educational needs arise in another field, in the blossoming cities, the merchant and the artisan, required a different practical education than was given to the scholar or judge. The erection of schools by the city was resorted to for the purpose of, provi of providing these circles with the necessary important instruction. With the development of industrial capitalism and the increasing demand for skilled labor, the so-called trade school is born in the field of material labor. In order to support the national industry, governments and private persons began to establish trade and artisan schools. Destined to provide such vocational instruction to the pupils as they had formerly obtained in the master's shop. This school undergoes certain changes with the growth of large-scale industry and the increasing demand for masters, supervisors, foremen, etc. 
Simultaneously, the intermediate schools and higher trade schools giving more prominence to natural science and mathematics now flourish on a very large scale, also commercial universities, agricultural schools, etc. The above cited German idealist philosopher F. Paulsen expounds the significance of capitalist education with frank brutality. These passages in his work are so instructive and give so precise a picture that we must present them unabridged. Paulsen's frankness may be explained by the fact that he is contributing to a thick and heavy volume which will not fall into the hands of the workers. <clears throat> he therefore writes for the capitalist bandits only and can afford to tell tales out of school. The actual outline of the educational system is determined everywhere in the main by the outline of society and its stratification. The form of the public educational system will always reflect the condition of the society producing it. Society shows everywhere a double stratification, a grouping according to the form of the social performance of labor and a grouping of by property relations. The first grouping furnishes the division into vocational stations. The difference in property gives rise to the division into social classes. Both have an influence on the educational system. The main outlines of the social performance of labor, the vocational social station, determine on the whole the varieties of instructional type, the class membership or the property standing of their families to a great extent determines the distribution of young men to the various courses. It, society, needs and has motor, executive, and mentally operating and guiding functions and organs. The first group includes all those whose labor achievement is essentially that of bodily strength and manual dexterity. Here we should place the industrial workers and artisan of all kinds, artisans of all kinds, rural work workers and small peasants, and lastly, those employed in trade and transportation as the lowest executive instruments. The second group includes those whose vocational task essentially is that of controlling the social labor process and giving instructions and guidance to manual laborers. Here belong the factory owners and technical specialists, managers of great farms, merchants and bankers, higher employees in trade and transportation, also sub subaltern officials in the service of a nation and community. The third group finally includes those professions customarily classed as learned. Their practice requires an independent grasping and extending of scientific knowledge. Here belong research workers and inventors, also the incumbents of the higher places in the civil and military service, in church and school, physicians, engineers in high position, etc. The grading of the schools corresponds to these three groups. Paulson's statements are an excellent indication of the school mechanism. On the one hand, it provides the necessary number of labor forces for each material and mental task. On the other hand, the higher ideological functions always remain fixed to a certain class, the educational monopoly, and with it, the capitalist order of society, being thus maintained. But Paulson is wrong in placing himself and his ilk over the manufacturers and bankers whose boots the learned gentlemen lick on all necessary and unnecessary occasions. Thus the school illustrates the practical roots of all ideologies. If any mathematician should be indignant at our suggesting that his pure science has any earthly import, we shall merely ask him to inform us why mathematics is studied by the merchant's sons in the commercial high schools, the would-be agro agronomists in the agricultural schools, the would-be engineers in the engineering schools, etc. He may reply that only the riffraff of the profession would consent to give them instruction. We should then ask him why pure mathematicians, who really seem quite ignorant of practical life, should deliver lectures before persons preparing for the professions of engineering or agriculture. Our mathematician may go so far as to say that there are some scholars that give no instruction, deliver no lectures. But surely, as we should then assert, these men write books which are read by professors who give instruction to future engineers who make use of what knowledge 
they acquire in order to calculate problems in the construction of bridges, steam boilers, electrical power stations, etc. Furthermore, the case of the school indicates the relative need of the specific society for various types of skilled labor, including the highest. The various sciences are therefore as much interconnected by the bond of labor as are the various branches of material labor. Likewise, the other branches of ideological labor are connected with the sciences, all being based ultimately and constantly on material labor. G. The Significance of the Superstructure We may now take up a more detailed study of the significance of all the varieties of the superstructure, including the ideologies, which may best be done in a critical examination of the objection, objections commonly raised by the opponents of the theory of historical materialism. First, there are the objections to the practical roots of ideology, to the claim that the forms of the superstructure, including those of ideology, may have significance as services. We are told that scholars or artists very often are not concerned at all with the practical role played by their thoughts or constructions. On the contrary, the scholar in his search for pure truth is merely expressing his love of this goddess. His marriage to her is a love match based on no practical considerations of any kind. Similarly, we are told that the true artist loves art for art's sake. Art is his highest goal. Art alone gives life meaning for him. As a jurist may declare that he would wish to see the world destroyed rather than that justice be not done. So the true musician would give everything else in the world for a single glorious symphony. The true artist lives for his art, the scholar for science, the jurist for the state, Hegel, for instance, considers the Prussian junker capitalist state to be the highest manifestation of the world spirit in human history, and therefore worthy of receiving self-sacrifice, etc. Now, is it true that scholars and artists have this attitude, or are they pulling the wool over the eyes of the public? While the latter may sometimes occur, we have not the right to approach the subject from this angle. Thousands of examples prove that a true scholar or artist or the theoretical jurist loves his vocation as he loves himself, without regard to his practical phases. But it would be wrong to have the matter end there, for the subject of the psychology of the ideologists is not to be confused with their objective rule. Man's view of his labor is not identical with the role. The, the significance of his labor for society let us examine the growth of an ideology. Mathematics, for instance, arose on the basis of practical needs, became specialized and divided off into a number of branches. The specialist is not aware of the practical needs satisfied by his science. He is interested in his own work. The more he loves it, the more productive will it be. Other persons working in other fields will apply his theory. Before the days of specialization, the practical significance of science was apparent to everyone. Now it has been lost. Knowledge formerly served practice, even in men's minds. It still serves practice, but the minds of the closeted specialists represent knowledge as entirely divorced from practice. The causes are not far to seek. Man's thinking is influenced by his being. To a man working in one ideological field only, this field must appear as the navel of the earth, about which all else revolves. This man lives in the atmosphere of his specialty, for, as Engels has excellently put it, ideology is simply the occupying oneself with thoughts as with independent entities developing independently, subject only to their own laws. Before the days of specialization, a man might have thought, I guess I'll take up some geometry in order to measure the fields down by the shore next year. But the mathematical specialist would probably say, I have got to solve this problem. It is my life work. Somewhat different in expression, but identical in sense is Ernst Mach's formulation of the case. For the artisan, and more still for the scientist, the quickest, simplest mental acquisition with the slightest mental outlay 
of a certain field of natural phenomena is itself an economic object in which, although it was originally a means to an end, there is now no longer a thought of physical need, once the corresponding mental impulses have developed and demand exercise. Thus the system of the superstructure, from the social-political to the philosophical phase inclusive, is connected with the canonic base and the technical system of the spe specific society being a necessary link in the chain of social phenomena. In this connection, Engels says in a letter addressed to Franz Mehring, dated July 14, 1893, ideology is a process accomplished, to be sure, by so-called thought, but with a false consciousness. This mess does not know the actual motive forces behind it, otherwise it would not be an ideological process. Being a process of thought, it derives its content as well as its form from pure thought, either on its own part or on that of its predecessors. It works with mere mental material, which it assumes and accepts as the product of thought, and for which it does not seek any more remote process that may be independent of thought, and all this is self-evident to this process, for it regards all action since it works through thought as also in the last instance based on thought. This illusion of an independent history of national constitutions, legal systems, ideological conceptions is each special in, in each special field of knowledge is the element that leads most persons astray mentally. Another frequent objection to our theory results from pretending that it declares economy to be the only true element in life, all other elements being childish folly, illusions, vague mists. This conception represents historical materialism as stating the existence of various factors in history, economy, politics, art, etc., et some of which are very important, others unimportant, but the economic factor is the only real factor, all the other being others being a sort of fifth wheel of the wagon. This representation of the Marxian conception is then diligently bombarded with, with refutations. It is pointed out that many other things are important besides economy, but it would be erroneous to interpret our view of ideology in this way. The superstructure is not child's play. We have shown that a destruction of the capitalist state would make capitalist production impossible, that a destruction of modern science would involve also that of large-scale production and technology, that an elimination of the, ma of the means of human intercourse, language, and literature would cause society to disintegrate. The theory of historical materialism does not deny the importance of the superstructure in general, and of the ideo ideologies in particular, but explains them. As we have shown in our chapter on determinism and indeterminism, this is quite a different attitude. It would be equally incorrect to consider the various factors from the point of view of their unequal value, to admit the importance of economy, but to belittle that of politics or science. Many misunderstandings result from such an interpretation. Why attempt to set up a scale of the relative importance of these factors when we recall that capitalist economy could not exist without capitalist politics? It would be difficult to decide whether, in a rifle, the barrel or the trigger was the more important, or, in the human body, the left hand or the right foot, or, in a watch, the spring or the cogwheel. Some things are more important than others. Economy is more important than dancing, but in many cases it is absurd to make such a statement. A system may contain sections that are of equal importance for the existence of the whole. The trigger is as important in a rifle as the barrel. A single screw in a piece of mechanism may be as important as any other part, for without it the mechanism might cease to be a mechanism. Similarly, in a consideration of the superstructural labor as a portion of the total social labor, it would be equally absurd to ask either of the following questions. Which is more important for modern industry, metallurgy or mining? Which is more important, direct material labor or labor in economic administration? At certain stages in evolution, the two may be inseparable. This theory, the theory of these factors, played the same role in the evolution of social science. The progress of natural science has shown us the unity of these forces, the modern doctrine of energy. Likewise, the progress of social science has necessarily led to a displacement of the theory of factors, this product of social analysis by a synthetic conception of social life. We therefore reject the theory of factors, 
but there remains a basis for the distinction between material production and the superstructure and for a study of their mutual relations. The true difference is in the different character of their functions. The administration of production does not play the same part as does production itself. The former eliminates friction, systematizes and coordinates the various elements of work, or to put it differently, institutes a certain adjustment of work. We have also seen, for instance, that morality, customs, and other standards coordinate men's actions and keep them within certain bounds, thus preventing society from disintegrating. Science, likewise, let us suppose we are speaking of the natural sciences, ultimately serves as a guide for the process of production, increases its effectiveness, and regulates its operation. We have defined the similar function of philosophy, which coordinates and regulates, or seeks to do so, the contradictions between the various sciences due to their division of labor. Philosophy arises from the sciences, as the administration of production arises from production. Neither is primary, both are secondary, neither original, both derivative. Yet philosophy controls the sciences to a certain degree, for it imparts to them their common point of view, their method, etc. Another example that has already been treated is that of language. The latter grows out of production, develops under the influence of the social evolution, i.e. its evolution is determined by the natural law of social evolution. The function of language is to coordinate man's actions, for mutual understanding is the simplest form of adaptation, coordination, in relations, actions, even, to a certain extent, in feelings, etc. The fundamental import of the distinction between material production and ideological labor, or any other superstructural labor, should now be clear. Their mutual relation is in, in the fact that ideological labor is a derived quantity, also constituting a regulating principle. With regard to the whole of social life, the distinction lies in their difference of functions. We have now practically answered also the question as to the reverse relation, the influence of the superstructure on the economic base, basis and on the productive forces of society. The superstructure growing out of the economic conditions and the productive forces determining these conditions in its turn exerts an influence on the latter, favoring or retarding their growth. But, um, but in either case, there is no doubt of this reverse process. In other words, a constant process of mutual cause and effect is in operation between the various categories of social phenomena. Cause and effect change place. But if we recognize this mutual influence, what becomes of the basis of Marxian theory? For most bourgeois scholars admit a mutual interaction. May we still say that the productive forces and the production conditions are the basis of our analysis? Are not our own hands destroying what they have built up? These doubts are quickly disposed of. However numerous these mutual influences, the basic fact, basic fact remains. At any given moment, the inner structure of society is determined by the mutual relation between the society and external nature, i.e. by the conditions of the material productive forces of society. The change in form, however, is determined by the movement of the productive forces. We go further than merely to admit the existence of a set of mutual relations, for we understand that all the countless processes at work within society, all their intersecting, colliding, accumulating forces and elements are operating within a common frame, provided by the mutual relation between society and nature. Perhaps our opponents will attempt to controvert this principle, already known to Goeth in its general outlines and expressed by him in his poem. The Metamorphosis of Animals, a poem not so well known as his Metamorphosis of Plants. All the limbs take shape according to laws immortal, even unusual forms always remaining close to original type. Thus, the animal's mode of life determines its figure, as well as its habits. It has a mighty reverse influence on all types. Thus, the orderly formation is firmly shown tending to fluctuate as influenced by beings working from without. This thesis is irrefutable. It follows that our analysis must begin with the productive forces, that the countless mutual dependences between the various parts of society do not eliminate the basic 
ultimate dependence of all social phenomena on the evolution of the productive forces, that the diversity of the causes operating in society does not contradict the, ex the existence of a single unified causal relation in social evolution. We cannot take up here the individual objections of the various bourgeois scholars. Their number is legion. Essentially, they are all chewing the same old insipid cud. Let us take one of the latest critical essays as an example. Professor V. M. Kvostov expounds Marxist theory as follows. It consists on the whole in assigning among the historical factors the chief place to the economic factor, all other phenomena being shaped under the one-sided influence of the economic conditions. After our recent remarks in large type, we need hardly to inform the reader whether Kvostov's conception of Marxian theory is a correct one, but to do him justice, Mr. Kvostov constitutes no exception. On the contrary, the greater the erudition displayed in the refutation of Marx, the greater the ignorance displayed by in expounding his doctrine. We shall take one more specimen of refutation from the same professor. I believe that man is characterized by the most varied aspirations. In the first place, he is concerned with preserving his physical existence for which he undertakes certain actions. In the second place, he makes an effort to evaluate the universe in himself, and this is a peculiar human tendency, independent of any material calculations. In the third place, man also possesses such desires as, for example, the love of domination, the love of freedom. Men also have religious, aesthetic needs, a need for the sympathy of their surroundings, etc. Having served us this chowder of human needs, Kvostov draws the conclusion that a monistic explanation is impossible. But Kvostov's example quoted above will serve to indicate the full absurdity of his view, quite current among scholars all over the world, as well as the necessity for a monistic explanation. In fact, is it not a parody of scientific thought to consider the tendency to religion, to domination, etc., as eternal categories? Kvostov never even thinks of asking for an explanation of them. Religion exists. How shall we explain it? Well, by means of man's need of religion. Domination exists. Why? Simply because man has a desire for domination. Is this not similar to explaining sleep as due to a force that puts to sleep? Can anything be explained in this way? By the use of this method, everything in the world can be explained without turning an eyelid. The state is explained by the desire for the state, art by the desire for art, the circus by the desire for the circus. Kvostov's explanations by the need felt for Kvostov's explanations, walking by the desire for walking, and so on ad infinitum. Such a theory of the historical process is not worth a penny. The love of liberty is an inherent tendency in man. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Was the love of liberty an inherent tendency in Nicholas II during his reign or in his class? Of course not. In spite of Kvostov, this noble impulse is not therefore present in all men. When we have understood this, we are faced with the next question. Why do certain men have this tendency while others do not? And then, oh horror, we must go back to the conditions of their existence, etc. The same applies to all the rest of Kvostov's different needs. The scholars of the bourgeoisie, in kicking against the traces of a mon monistic interpretation, are in reality fighting against any form of explanation at all. H. The Formative Principles of Social Life we are now prepared to discuss the general section or the general questions of the possibility of distinguishing a definite characteristic of each specific era. Shall we perhaps find that the connection existing between all the social phenomena will express itself in the existence of some element common to all? We have seen that they are all determined in the last analysis by the productive forces and the productive or production relations. How may this connection be recapitulated? recapitulated in a few words. How shall this problem be approached? Let us consider art, one of the finest, most complicated phenomena of mental life. 
In each epoch, as we have seen, art has its own style, expressing itself in specific forms, indicative of the specific content. Let us recall the example of the Egyptian art, which, in turn, is indicative of a specific ideology. The ideology is the outgrowth of a specific psychology, the psychology of a specific economy, the economy of a specific stage of the productive forces. Now, if we observe a certain definiteness of forms in all the fields of social life, may we assert that all these fields have their style? We may. It is as reasonable to speak of the style of science as of the style of art. We may speak of a style of life, i.e. of typical specific forms of life. We may in a certain sense speak of the style of the social economy, meaning precisely that Marx terms the production relations, the mode of production, the economic structure of society. As the style of a certain building is determined by the specific combination of its elements, so the style of social economy expresses itself in the peculiarities of the production relations, the specific manner in which the elements of the social whole are connected with each other. The peculiar shape and manner in which this union is realized distinguishes the various epochs of the social structure. But in addition to the mode of production, there's also a mode of conception, as Marx puts it. Such is the style of the ideology of the given period in general, i.e. that special combination of ideas, thoughts, feelings, forms, characteristic of the specific epoch, the uniformity of scientific thinking, of conceptions of the world and of life, to use the words of Professor Marb. Is it possible thus to distinguish the mode of production and the mode of conception? Is it possible to distinguish between the economic style of a specific society and the ideological style? From what has been said concerning the superstructures in general and the ideologies in particular, it is certain that we have the right to do this. We may show this by means of an example. Feudal society. The economic style of feudal society is expressed in the principles of a fixed hierarchy, the idea of rank. Marx characterizes the feudal epoch as follows. Here, instead of the independent man, we find everyone dependent, serfs and lords, vassals and suzerains, laymen and clergy. Personal dependence here characterizes the social relations of production just as much as it does the other spheres of life, organized on the basis of that production. This character of the economy and the other spheres of life is precisely the style of the epoch, the hierarchical arrangement by rank in economy. The hierarchical dependence in the other spheres of life, the hierarchical style of the entire ideology. Indeed, the entire philosophy of man was then religious, and religion is a philosophy that explains everything in a hierarchical manner, according to rank. Science is permeated with this idea of rank, so is art, and we find this condition expressed in the style. In the Middle Ages, rank is the style of all life. And the uniformity of this style proves the dependence of the mode of consumption on the mode of production of the system of ideas on the system of persons, the latter in turn being conditioned by the system of objects, i.e. by the social material productive forces. Such a basic stratum of style as is here afforded by hierarchy, hierarchy or rank may be termed the formative principle of social life based as we have seen on the production relations. This unity in the style of life is so obvious that even many bourgeois scholars come very close to accepting this view. Karl Lamprecht, for example, sets up the doctrine of the dominant of personality, i.e. the prevailing type of psychology changing with the conditions of the epoch in which the old dominant is destroyed and a new one arises, a new style of life being created. In the solution of the question of formative principles, we also have a fairly simple solution of the question raised by Hamacher. The latter mobilizes the following chief objection to the theory of historical materialism. It remains a constant problem why only the economic relations could obtain admission into the historical soul. This enigma is easily solved. Men are influenced not only by economic stimuli, but by everything that lies within the sphere of their experience. 
The general formative principles are determined, however, by the production relations, which are therefore reflected also in the ideological fields. This may be best observed in the case of religion. No doubt sunlight, thunder, death, sleep all found admission to the historical soul. But the conception of godhood, of a sublime power, of rank in creation did not arise until rank had already been established in social life. Into this frame all appropriate phenomena were jammed in, including sleep and death. Approaching the subject from another angle, in bloody despotisms, the god of war was frequently the chief of all the gods. Being the god of war, he naturally also became god of thunder and, light and lightning, which were the most awful belligerent forces of nature. Thunderstorms made an impression on the historical soul, but this material was shaped by the frame of the social relations. We might ask why the social relations give shape to this material. Where is the inner relation? The reason is very simple. The social environment has the foundations of its life in the production relations. We know that the uniformity of psychical phenomena may be traced back to the uniformity in the conditions of these phenomena. Many facts taken from this field are, to a certain extent, cultural products. Huber has shown that in experiments in psychological association, the quality of the reaction words depends, among other things, on the vocation and the habits of life of the persons experimented on. In other words, different answers will be given to the same question, for instance, a request for a certain word, depending on the habits of life of the persons experimented on. It is therefore not surprising to find the social psychology and ideology to be dependent on the mode of production of material life and simultaneously on the product productive forces. I, the ty are types of economic structure, types of various societies. Any investigation of society will encounter certain historical types of society. In other words, there's no such thing as society in general. We are always dealing with society in a specific historical raiment. Each society wears the uniform of its time. For we know that any specific society is an aggregate of human beings in constant interrelation with each other. These interrelations being based on the labor relations of men, on the system of production relations. If these mutual labor relations be visualized at any given moment, but the system of production relations is the aggregate of human beings arranged in a specific manner, namely of beings connected on, not only by a labor bond, but by a specific type of such bond. It is therefore evident that society exists only on a specific labor basis, and as this specific basis, the specific mode of production gives rise to a specific mode of conception, view of life. It follows that it will condition the type of society as a whole, and not only in its material productive or ec economic portion. The technology conditions the mode of production. The mode of production conditions the view of life. This chain uniting the material, human, and mental system creates a certain type of society. As we distinguish genera, species, and family in the animal world, so we distinguish social types in sociology. This has been repeatedly emphasized, but we must again point out as our basic thought that this difference between the social types may, may be traced not, traced not only in the economic field, but also in any other series of social phenomena. The type of a society may be inferred from its ideology as well as from its economy. Feudal art permits one to draw conclusions as to feudal conditions of production. Feudal conditions of production enable one to make inferences as to feudal art or religion or feudal thinking in general, etc., etc. The deciphering of certain literary monuments ex excavated by the archaeologists enables us to form a picture of the life and manners of races that have disappeared. A reading of Hammurabi's Codex makes the economic life of Babylon live in our minds. The Iliad and the Odyssey permit us to form a conception of early Greek history, etc. The historical forms of society, the specific nature of these forms, are applicable not only to the economic basis, but also to the aggregate of social phenomena, for the economic structure also determines the political structure and the ideological structure. One being given, the other is also given. 
To be sure, this does not mean that a type of society must be so sharply distinguished from another as to leave no common traits between them. Epochs in the history of society are no more separated from each other by hard and fast lines of demarcation than are geological periods. On the contrary, in actual reality we find that each new social type, each new social structure may present very great and decisive remnants of the old economic formations. For example, we find in modern capitalist society a great number of remnants of earlier economic forms. Thus, the entire great class of the peasantry with its economic life may be considered on the whole as a remnant of the feudal ages, the petty artisans likewise, etc. Pure capitalism implies a bourgeoisie and a proletariat, but not a peasantry, not an artisan class, etc. If such purity cannot be found in the economic structure, it is obvious that there will be a certain mingling of ideas in the ideological field also. Capitalist society may therefore present us with many remnants of feudal ideology, for instance, among the landed nobility and the peasantry, rural classes that are based on earlier agricultural relations and which still retain certain traditional traits. The interweaving of economic forms will be accompanied by an interweaving of ideological forms, with the result that there never is an absolutely uniform mode of production, and of course, still less a uniform mode of conception, for the latter varies even among the various classes that may at the given moment be a part of the same economic structure. It does not follow, however, that we cannot and should not distinguish between the various types of production relations. For in any actually existing society, a certain type of production relations is dominant, and there is also therefore a certain prevalent view of life. Werner Sombart is right when he says, I distinguish a certain epoch in the economic life of the predominance of a specific spirit in a specific period. Marx, speaking of capitalism, likewise terms it the form of society in which capitalist production is predominant. As we may distinguish between ape and man in the animal kingdom in spite of their many common traits, so we may distinguish also between the various forms of society in spite of their common traits in spite of the fact that the higher forms are frequently present quite useless remnants of older forms, so-called rudiments, which are incomprehensible at first sight. In chapter 3, we have already spoken of the necessity of distinguishing in any treatment of society the social form which is rooted in the peculiarities of the economic structure. This conception has been vigorously and repeatedly opposed by official bourgeois science, which is hostile to the notion of a radical transformation of social relations. Bourgeois scholars themselves now admit that the crux of the matter is in the above fact. Thus, Dr. Bernhard Obenbright, or Odenbright writes, Marx, as is only natural in the case of a revolutionary, has a particularly sharp eye for the historical, transitory nature of all social institutions. This general social understanding is joined with a consciously critical reflection of the narrower field of political economy. Precisely so, the sharp eye for that which is changing will be found only in the revolutionary. This is, of course, one of the principal reasons for the superiority of the social sciences of the revolutionary proletariat over the social sciences of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie. In so-called primitive communism, the oldest form of society known to us, the type of production relations in which the economic personality is not yet isolated from the horde, we also find the corresponding forms of consciousness, absence of religion, of ideas of rank, even of the notion of personality of the individual per se. Similarly, a consideration of so-called of so feudal society shows that its essential traits consist on the one hand in the splitting up of the land into a number of independent estates, principalities, and privileged holdings, and on the other hand in the organization of these holdings by means of contractual vassal relations. The style of e economy is here hierarch hierarchic. Likewise, the style of politics of the, of the ideology. As we have already seen, the notion of rank is everywhere prevalent. The basis is the large landed estate, no land without its master, inert and, un and uneventful. The economic bonds are bonds between feudal landowners and serfs. 
These relations are stable, immobile, and from the point of view of the members of feudal society, immutable. Everything is fixed in its place in the hierarchic order. Let the shoemaker stick to his last. The same condition was reflected in the political superstructure that was expressive of these produc production conditions. The hierarchic tendency of feudal life was elevated by the learned jurists of the 13th century into a theory and a system. The preachers have a clear vision of the horizontal distribution of society as a whole, even though it be divided into masters and servants. The latter are admonished to follow the words of the apostle commanding slaves to obey, to obey their masters, since God has installed kings and dukes on earth, and other men in order that the latter might obey the former. God so disposed things as to enable the weak to depend on the strong. The entire conception of life is religious, i.e. permeated with the notion of rank, or to use another term, it is authoritarian. Its rigidity, its fidelity to, tradi to tradition are a natural result. Science consists chiefly in interpreting the tradition and the sacred scriptures. Art is divine, magnifying in its form and content the higher celestial and terrestrial powers. The dominant morality and the dominant manners and morals are those inculcated by feudal fidelity, noble arrogance, pious awe of the commandments of ancestors, respect for gentle bearing and gentle lineage. Quod licet jovi non licet bovi. In other words, we are here dealing with a specific social species, a specific form of society beginning with its material basis and rising to the highest forms of social consciousness. Let us now consider capitalist society whose economic basis is an entirely different type of relations. The contrast between the power based on the personal relations of dominion and servitude that is conferred by landed property and the impersonal power that is given by money is well expressed by the two French proverbs, uh, nul terre sans seigneur and l'argent n'a pas de maître. In this sentence, Marx has revealed one of the fundamental relations in capitalist society, namely the connection between the various enterprises through the market, whence results also the impersonal power of this market and the impersonal abstract power of money. But there is another phase also. The impersonal social power of money turned to capital nevertheless finds its master, insofar as simple commodities production is transformed into a capitalistic production. Just as every qualitative difference between commodities is, is extinguished in money, so money on its side, like the radical leveler that it is, does away with all distinctions. But money itself is a commodity, an external object capable of becoming the private property, property of any individual. Thus, social power becomes the private power of private persons. From this follows another trait in the economy of capitalist society, namely its hierarchic character. This trait has also been brilliantly outlined by Marx, particularly in his chapter on cooperation. The control of the capitalist is in form despotic. As cooperation extends its scale, this despotism takes forms peculiar to itself. Just as at first the capitalist is relieved from actual labor so, so soon as his capital has reached that minimum amount with which capitalist production as such begins, so now he hands over the work of direct and constant supervision of individual workmen and groups all workmen into a special kind of wage laborer. An industrial army of workmen under the command of a capitalist requires like a real army, officers, managers, and sergeants, foremen, overlookers, who while the work is being done command in the name of the capitalist. The work of supervision becomes their established and exclusive function. The capitalist mode of production is therefore twofold in character. On the one hand, it is the summation of the individual private economies, enterprises, united by the anarchic bond of the market through exchange, the blind elemental force of the market controlling each individual economy. On the other hand, it is a hierarchic system with capital in command. Naturally, this mode of production has also produced its corresponding view of life. Its style must reflect its twofold nature. 
and indeed the view of life of capitalist society is characterized on the one hand by what Marx terms the fetishism of commodities, and on the other hand by the principle of rank, which we have already observed in feudal society. The combination of these two formative principles results in the fundamental style of the view of life prevalent in the capitalist world. We must now define the fetishism of commodities. In a system or in a society of commodities, capitalism, the, the enterprise works independently for an unknown market. But each labor here constitutes a section of the social labor, all the sections being mutually dependent. But the social relation between men actually at work for each other is concealed to the eye. If we were dealing with a socialist economy in which all things proceed according to plan, it would be perfectly clear at first glance that men are working for each other, that each individual type of labor is merely a section of the general social labor, etc. The relations between men would then be clear, the mists dispelled, but the case in the capitalist world is quite different. Here the labor relation between men is invisible, being concealed by the manipulations of the market, where commodities are shifted, sold, and bought. The market is not rationally controlled by men, but through its prices controls men. Men observe the movements of commodities without understanding that they are working for each other, all men being related by the common labor bond. The latter appears to them as a specific miraculous power of commodities, as a value of these commodities. Relations between men present themselves as relations between commodities. That is what we mean by the fetishism of commodities, the ascribing to commodities of qualities truly inherent in human labor. This fetishism, which causes a definite social relation between men to assume in their eyes the fantastic form of a relation between things, constitutes the peculiar earmark of the capitalist view of life. We have already observed that bourgeois scholars, artists, philosophers, etc., are irritated by discussions concerning the social roots of science, art, or philosophy. They are out and out fetishists, for they disregard the social connections, being unable to conceive of their inspired divine labor as merely a portion of the total social labor. The fetishism of the capitalist world is very graphically indicated in the field of the so-called moral standards of ethics, a favorite topic with the learned professors. We have already ascertained that the ethical norms are the rules of the conduct for the preservation of the society or of the class or of the vocational group, etc. They have a necessary social service significance. Yet in fetishistic society, this human and social significance of standards is not recognized. On the contrary, these standards, i.e. the technical rules of conduct, appear as a duty dwelling far above men like any other external divine compulsion. This inevitable fetishism of ethics is excellently expressed by the bourgeois philosophic genus, genius, Immanuel Kant, and his doctrine of the categorical imperative. The proletariat must approach the question from a different angle. The proletariat must not preach a, capitalist, a capitalistic fetishism. For the proletariat, the standards of its conduct are technical rules in precisely the sense of the rules according to which a joiner constructs an armchair. The latter, wishing to construct an armchair, armchair will plane, saw, glue, etc., which acts, are, which acts are involved in the labor process itself. He will not interpret the rules of woodworking as something foreign to him, of supernatural origin, whose victim he is. The attitude of the proletariat in its social struggle, struggle is precisely the same. If it would attain communism, it would do this and that as the joiner at work on his armchair. And everything required from this point of view must be done. Ethics will ultimately, in the case of the proletariat, be transformed into simple and easily understood technical rules of conduct. Such are required for communism. And thus, it will really cease to be ethics at all, for the essence of ethics is in the fact that it involves norms enveloped in a fetishistic raiment. Fetishism is the essence of ethics. Where fetishism disappears, ethics also will disappear. For instance, no one would think of designating the constitution of a consumer store or of a party as ethical or moral, for anyone can see the human significance of these things. 
Ethics, on the other hand, presupposes a fetishistic mist which turns the heads of many persons. The proletariat needs rules of conduct and it needs to have them very clear, but it has no need of ethics, i.e. a fetishistic sauce to flavor the meal. Of course, it is obvious that the proletariat will not at once succeed in liberating itself from the fetishism of the commodities society in which it lives, but that is another question. The fetishism of the ideology of capitalism and commodities is merged with the principle of rank, and these two fundamental formative principles constitute the nucleus of the capitalist mode of thought, the framework for the ideological material. Capitalist society is thus a special type of society with special characteristic traits in all the levels of social life, up to the highest ideological superstructure. The type of economic structure, therefore, also determines the type of the social political structure and of the ideological structure. Society has a basic style in all the dominant phenomena of its life. J. The contradictory character of evolution, external and internal equilibrium of society. We have examined above the phenomena of social equilibrium, but we must not lose sight of the fact that we are dealing with a mobile equilibrium, i.e. a situation in which equilibrium is being constantly disturbed, then re-established on an altered basis, then again disturbed. We are dealing, in other words, with a process of contradictions, not of rest. We are not discussing a condition of absolute adjustment, but a struggle between opposites, a dialectic process of motion. In considering the structure of society, i.e. the mutual relations between its parts, we may not conceive of this relation as a perfect harmony between these parts. Every structure involves internal contradictions. In every social class form, these contradictions are very sharp. Bourgeois sociologists, while recognizing the mutual relation of the various social phenomena, do not understand the internal oppositions of the social forms. In this respect, the entire school founded by the originator of bourgeois sociology, Auguste Kant, is very interesting. Comte recognizes the relation between all the social phenomena, the so-called consensus, in which its order is expressed. But the contradictions within this order, particularly such as lead to its inevitable destruction, do not receive his attention. On the other hand, for the advocates of dialectical materialism, this phase is in one of the most essential, perhaps the most essential phase. For as we have seen, the contradictions in any given system are precisely the moving element, leading to an alteration of forms, to a characteristic transformation of species in the process of social evolution or social decline. In our consideration of the social structure, we have seen that its alterations are closely connected with the alterations in the relation between society and nature. The latter equilibrium we have designated as an external equilibrium, while the equilibrium between the various series of social phenomena has been called the internal equilibrium of society. If we now regard all of society from the point of view of a contradictory evolution, we are at once faced with a number of questions. In the first place, we shall find the existence of contradictions within each series of social phenomena. For example, in economy, the contradictions between the various labor functions, in the social political structure, the contradictions between classes, in ideology, contradictions between the ideological systems of the classes, etc., not to mention many other contradictions. We shall find also without difficulty the contradictions between economy and politics, for instance, when legal standards have been outdistanced by the economic evolution and a reform becomes mature between economy and ideology and between psychology and ideology. For instance, the need for of something new is felt, but the new has not yet been expressed in ideolo ideo ideological form, between science and philosophy, etc. These are contradictions between the series of the various social phenomena. Both elements are a necessary part of the internal equilibrium, but there is a contradiction between society and nature, a disturbance of the equil equilibrium between society and its environment, which finds its, ex its expression in the movement of the productive forces. This is the field of external equilibrium. Of course, there is another extremely important case of contradiction, namely that between the movement of the productive forces and the social economic structure of society, and all the rest of the social structure. 
In this case, the relation obtaining between society and nature comes in conflict with the relations developed within society. Obviously, this conflict, this contradiction, must play a very important role in the life of society. For it concerns the basis of the existing order, the pillars on which the given order rests. We have here sketched only the principal questions involved in the social contradictions, the investigation of which is to be the subject of the next chapter, which will deal with society in motion. Thus far, we have considered chiefly the structure of society, of the given social form. We shall now undertake a treatment of the transitions from one structure to another. Again, we emphasize that the law of social equilibrium is a law of mobile e equilibrium that includes antagonisms, contradictions, incompatibilities, conflicts, struggles, and, this is particularly important, that it cannot dispense under certain circumstances with catastrophes and revolutions, which are absolutely inevitable. Our Marxian theory is the revolutionary theory.